Oh, hang on. There it goes. There, there it goes. There. Oh, so easy touch. Green lights comes on now, right? Yeah. Hello? Testing. Are you ready, Roberta? Yes. Then I'd like to call the October 18, 2011 Board of Supervisors meeting to order. We're going to go into our closed session and then come out for our regular meeting. But first, let's have our roll call. Supervisor Bennett? Here. Supervisor Here. 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 And we'll now go to closed session and be back for our uh, time six o'clock, five? Six o'clock, is that right? <laughs> we'll be back here in open session at six o'clock. Okay, uh, good evening. Welcome to the Board of Supervisors for October 18th, 2011 special Board of Supervisors meeting because we are in the beautiful city of Simi Valley. So with that, I will uh, ask our clerk to call the roll. Supervisor Matt. Here. Supervisor Zaragoza. Here. Supervisor Wong. Here. Supervisor Foy. Here. Here. Supervisor Parks. Here. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would ask that... Uh, we have uh, the moment of inspiration, and this is with, shall I turn it over to you, Supervisor, sure. and you I'll can introduce her? Thank you. Yeah, this is with uh, Shannon Sergi, somebody I've known for an awful long time. She is president and founder of Forever Found. Forever Found was established last year in 2010 by Shannon and her husband, who's here with her now, Taylor. Forever Found aids in, uh, in the full rescue of children victimized by child prostitution trafficking and by supporting aftercare homes around the world. As a matter of fact, Shannon just got back from a long trip to Africa looking at these homes. Um, Forever Found raises support for, through a unique way, through the development and promotion of works with the musicians, artists, and writers. Um, so and all those willing to donate the proceeds to help these children. Anyway, I said I've known Shannon. So Shannon, come on up here and tell us what you've been doing. Good evening. I'm so excited to be back here. Um, as a lot of you know, I used to work for Supervisor Foy, and so it's a blessing to be back and see you all again. Uh, really, I, I just kind of wanted to start a little bit, just telling you shortly what my story, my heart, and a little bit about what our ministry and why I'm just so thrilled to be doing the work that we're doing. I started about three years ago, really in the beginning of 2008, and the Lord had just really just burdened my heart to actually start uh, doing something with my life that would be lasting and would be eternal. Uh, I, was, I was super convicted by uh, 1 John 3, which says that true love is laying down our life for our brothers. And I just began seeing all the hurt in the world and just being broken about it and just asking God, please use me, do something. I want to do something. And I started seeing things. I actually wanted to mention, because it was funny, the timing of it all. During this time in my life when I was being led to start this ministry, I actually was watching one of the supervisors' meetings at work, and uh, my pastor and supervisor, Bennett, were talking about the orphans in our community, and I just began crying, and it was just days like that that I knew some, I had to do something, that God was calling me to do something. 
it was a Sunday shortly after that that uh, I became aware of the reality of child trafficking. And the statistics and what's going on just, just floored me. I mean, just, just to intro so that people know uh, just what we're talking about would just be, you know, the reality that, that right now there's hundreds of thousands of children in, in our community, in our country, that are, are suffering from this, that children internationally as young as five years old are being victimized. And the gravity of the issue and the reality of it, that it's become the second largest criminal industry in the world, human trafficking, and um, knowing this just broke my heart and shattered me. And I knew I had to do something. I, I got down on on my knees, actually, literally, and, and wrote a, a covenant, a, a contract with God and said, if you do something, I'll give you everything. And since then, it's just been an amazing journey. Um, what started, actually, with uh, CD, my CD, and this amazing team of musicians and producers came from I don't even know where and ended up volunteering hundreds of hours, thousands of dollars to produce this album and 100% of the proceeds went to child trafficking victims. And that's how it started. And from there, it expanded more than I had even imagined. Uh, we launched Forever Found about a year and a half ago. We're based locally here in Simi Valley. Currently, we have about 10 staff members, and we're all 100% volunteer. Um, our mission statement is that we exist to support the rescue and restoration, like Supervisor Foy said, of victims of child trafficking and prostitution. Uh, the interesting way that we do that is by partnering with these aftercare homes. Currently, we have five aftercare homes that we've partnered with, two domestic and three international. Our two domestic homes are in Northern California. One is east of Redding, and the other is in Phoenix, Arizona. Our three international homes are in Burma, which is on right outside of Thailand on the border, uh, which is a... It's de it, there's some devastating things going on there, so we're really happy that this ministry is there. Um, then in Ethiopia, near the city of Addis, and in Andhra Pradesh, India. And how we support these homes is kind of threefold. The first way is through awareness programs and events, and what we've had so far has been extremely blessed and successful, and just encouraging us to move forward because of what we've been able to accomplish thus far. And the second thing would be through the recruitment, the development, and the promotion of artists because a lot of people have gifts and they just don't know really what to do with them or how on earth us here in Simi Valley as a, say, a, a baby blanket maker, for example, could actually make a difference um, with a child who's being sold um, for s sexual exploitation, but, but you can. And so that's what we're here for. And the third thing would be through our child sponsorship program that we recently just launched and has it has grown exponentially in the last month, and I am just floored. And it's truly one of the most rewarding programs. So those are kind of the threefold way right now that we are supporting these aftercare homes. And as Supervisor Foy said, I, I recently returned from India and from Africa, and, and I can firsthand tell you that this isn't just statistics. These aren't just pictures that you see and, and dismiss, but this is a, a horrific reality that there are really no words for me to express to you or to um, try and explain because it's that heartbreaking. But I have to tell you that equal to that, I have never experienced the hope that I saw in these children that have been rescued. I have, I, I think about them regularly. I, I see their faces because these children have, have joy that's uh, inexplainable to anything I've seen. The, the dancing and the laughter that they do, it's, it's truly, I, I've never seen anything parallel to it personally um, up until this. I mean, there, there's true joy exuding. There's no, um, they don't have any filters, really. It's just all out there. It's, it's almost as if they know from the life from which they've been rescued, and they are just so filled with gratitude and joy that it just exudes from them. So I guess kind of today something that I just wanted to inspire everybody with was that uh, I obviously am, uh, you know, my experience and my knowledge pales in comparison to many, and uh, my uh, immaturities and things that I still have, you know, you'd think that there's some of us that you know aren't just aren't ready to make a difference, or we we don't have the time or the capability to to step out there. But I think my testimony would be that any of us can. And uh, all it really took for me was 
really a willing heart, um, surrender to God's will for my life and just the faith that you can move mountains and, and it, they have been moved. And so I would just like to encourage everybody who's listening that whatever has been put on your heart, you can make a tangible, eternal, a lasting, and truly a, a difference that you can see, that you can feel in the life of these children that have been exploited sexually. I've seen uh, so many girls and so many stories, just um, a couple of them would just be that um, girls rescued from the red light district in Addis who had been forced into prostitution there as children now are studying to be doctors or are being trained to uh, actually be equipped to go back into the red light district to rescue these children. I mean, I, I know these girls. Or um, little children who've been sold by their parents, literally sold for um, different amounts based on which location, but now they are attending school and at the top of their class speaking several languages. <laughs> or um, domestically, one of the girls was who, from an, a very affluent family, actually, in California, was lured into prostitution, and now she's free, and she's pursuing uh, her dream and her passion as an artist. So uh, honestly, I just, I'm honored to have been able to share this with you, and I am honored to be a part of this ministry, and I'm honored that God would, for whatever reason, see fit to use me. And so uh, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, the work you do with our community, and yeah, Everybody who's listening, if you could just continue your prayers for these victims and for our ministry, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for your inspiration. If people want to help and give to your organization, how can they contact you? Um, probably the best way would be through foreverfound.org. And I also do have business cards if anyone would like to receive them. But uh, my email is shannon at foreverfound.org. And all of our information is available, again, on, on our website. Well, incredibly inspirational what one person can do. And it's just such a, a huge issue for you to be able to tackle and see success. And we're very, very uh, proud to have you in our, in our county. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless. Shannon's uh, always been a very determined person, and she puts her mind to something, she gets it done. It's, it's been great. So thank you, Shannon. Appreciate that. Thank you for uh, bringing such a uh, moment of inspiration. Yeah. That's, as good as, that's as good as we've had mm -hmm. in terms of starting these meetings off. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And our, uh, the next item, we have an, another uh, supervisor for you, if you'd like to take that to introduce sure. Dr. Fredrickson. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Kurt Fredrickson is uh, the senior police chaplain of Simi Valley. He was recently named Simi Valley's, through ACORN, one of the most uh, community's top 25 influential people. And so you, you think about the chaplain, top 25 influential. This guy's doing a lot of different things. But uh, he has a uh, Fuller's Doctorate of Ministry, continuing education program, and assist in pastoral ministries around, but he's also, you know, somebody that's been part of the crime uh, prevention task force. He's on the task force for the homeless. He's just doing a whole lot. So he also is on the board of directors of the free clinic. This is one of these guys who just does everything. So, Kurt, thank you. Good evening, and welcome to Simi Valley. It's so nice to have all of you here in our chambers this evening. One of my heroes is Desmond Tutu, uh, retired Archbishop of Cape Town, Nobel Prize winner, just turned 80 years old. He once said, and this is Shannon's story right here, do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Uh, this evening, I want to take just a couple of moments uh, and share with you uh, the efforts that we're doing here in Simi Valley to reduce and to prevent homelessness. Homelessness is a reality in our world and in our city. Uh, in our lat latest street count in January, 226 homeless people were identified within our community. 77 students in the Simi Valley Unified School District are counted as homeless last year. Some homeless people are stuck in this lifestyle, trapped in addictions or mental illness, unwilling or unable to get help. Many are homeless because they've lost a job or because of a medical crisis 
or because of domestic violence or other circumstances beyond their control. Since 1999, City Council of Simi Valley has been working to address homelessness issues. In 2006, a strategy was developed with the goal of reducing homelessness by 10% each year for 10 years. Our work here in Simi Valley is the result of an amazing cooperation between the city, county agencies, nonprofits, local businesses, and the faith community. Our community provides a warm meal 365 days a year, provides a warming shelter during the winter months. The free clinic of Simi Valley provides medical, legal, dental, and counseling services to anybody in need, to those who are uninsured, to those who are underinsured, uh, to those who are homeless. The Samaritan Center here in town provides case management, a mail drop, laundry service for 461 homeless clients. The Salvation Army Care and Share, our local food bank, provides food for up to 800 families every month. The Alliance to House the Homeless is a project bringing together a number of different organizations in town to reduce homelessness. In 2010, 316 households representing 424 individuals received case management. In its first three years of existence, approximately 200 people have been housed for six months or more. And that's just a whole lot of statistics. But each one of those represents people, human beings who are on a tough road and we're trying to get them back on the right road. We don't want to just band-aid homelessness. We don't want to encourage homelessness. Rather, in our town, we are working really hard to reduce and to prevent homelessness. And we're seeing some great results. At the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. in February of 2006, Bono of U2 made these remarks before then-President Bush and other members of our heads of state and other guests. Bono said, the one thing we can all agree, all faiths, all ideologies, is that God is with the vulnerable and the poor. God is in the slums, in the cardboard boxes where the poor play house. God is in the silence of a mother who has infected her child with a virus that will end both of their lives. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and lives. And God is with us if we are with them. Our small acts in different segments of our population, girls who are being trafficked, people who are trapped in homelessness, the little bit that we do, in all these different places put together truly overwhelms the world. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> Thank you to Supervisor Foy for bringing this nice um, taste of See Me to our Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, at this time, then, we're going to go ahead and have a presentations of the colors by the Veterans of Foreign War Post 10,049 of Simi Valley. And at this time, um, I'm going to ask that the Colored Guard Commander please post the colors. Supervisor Foy, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, I will. Do you believe 
let us be honored to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the uh, Color Guard Commander, would you please retire or uh, do your retirement? Thank you, the audience. Please be seated. And we're not done yet with our opening ceremony here. <laughs> we now uh, have the honor of having this uh, national anthem sung to us by none other than Shannon Sergi. I told you she's a very talented girl. I, I hope she can sing. She's a little sick today, so hopefully. That's the end. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave the roof through the night that our flag was still there Whoa. And that's her when she's sick. <laughs> that was beautiful, Shannon. Thank you so much. I'm sure the uh, city of Simi Valley, whenever they have their city council meetings, they also begin with the wonderful moments of inspiration, the VFW doing the flag salute, and then, of course, Shannon doing the song. Um, so um, uh, at this time, I'll ask uh, the mayor of Simi Valley to come up. And if you can uh, provide us a, a, a welcome, we're so happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Those are uh, it's a hard act to follow those two inspirations. They were they were wonderful. Thank you, Supervisor Foy, for arranging that. Good evening, uh, Chair Parks and uh, members of the Board of Supervisors. On behalf of our City Council, we warmly welcome you here this evening. It's, it's the third time you've been here in, in the history of uh, coming and reaching out to, to the rest of the county, and we very much appreciate that. And uh, on behalf of our citizens, I want to say thank you. A warm warm welcome as well. Um, we've had a, a really great working relationship over the years collaboratively for different things such as the library and the uh, county courthouse and the public health facility and we're, we're committed to working with you uh, bringing services to this end of the county. We realize that you know there's some services that can't be brought here some 40, 40 miles away for people that live on the east end of our of our city. and um, But the, those that you do reach out with us, we, we don't take for granted and we appreciate very much. Um, 
I uh, also want to say thank you for your planning commission coming here a number of months ago and reaching out to this end of the county on an issue that involved our citizens, close, close citizens, for citizens of Sumi Valley and Moore Park, and that was the landfill expansion. So thank you very much for that. I have not been before you since that happened, and that wasn't taken for granted either. Uh, you're showing a lot, of, uh, a lot of outreach to the citizens on this end of the county, and we very, very much appreciate that. In closing, I'd again like to warmly welcome you to come back in the future and um, and we appreciate the access that you're giving our citizens by being here tonight um, and uh, wish you a productive meeting and a special thank you to Peter uh, Supervisor Foy for, for arranging for you to be here this evening. That's my understanding. And so again, on behalf of our city, a warm welcome. Hope you have a very, very productive meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hoover. And also just thank you for your wonderful outreach throughout the county. You serve on a lot of regional bodies and um, it's been a pleasure serving with you and uh, Appreciate all that you do here, too. At this time uh, on our agenda, we will go to our minutes, and this is of the meeting of October 4th, and I'll look to uh, our board for a motion. Move approval. Second. Okay, we, are, we have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 And no objections, that passes. Our next item on the agenda is our agenda review, and I will turn it over to our CEO, Mike Powers, for any recommended changes to our agenda. Uh, thank you, Chair Parks. Just to highlight that uh, there was an addendum agenda, a closed session conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, California Department of Forestry and Fire versus Southern California Gas. There's also a time certain uh, agenda, item 21, revised exhibit one. The grant deed was revised from Ventura County Fire Protection District to County of Ventura. And then lastly, uh, item 28, there's a recommendations one and two, they require a four-fifths vote. And Thank that's you. It. Um, we have those changes. If there are no other uh, recommended changes, could I have a motion to accept the agenda as revised? So moved. We have a motion from Supervisor Long and a second from Supervisor Foy. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. And uh, no one opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Our next item on the agenda is what we call our consent agenda, and these are items 16 through 18. And uh, I would note, just to say a, a shout out, as what a big help uh, Teresa Bucci has been to our staff with insurance forms and such and her great community outreach. So it's nice to see her being appointed as an alternative, to, uh, an alternate <laughs> to, to the Cal State, California State Association of Counties. Um, with that, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda items? We have second. a motion from Supervisor Foy and a second from Supervisor Long. And all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposition? Hearing none, that motion passes. We generally don't get to say aye. We have to push a button. So this is new for us that we can talk. <coughs> uh, the next item on our agenda is our public comment. So here's an opportunity for citizens to come and address the Board of Supervisors. Looks like I have one card for this. This card says item 21, Roberta, so I'll wait on that one. So this one is uh, from Jim Dantona on the landfill. Mr. Dantona, you're up. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim Dantona, 29-year resident of Simi Valley, and I'm glad to see the Board of Supervisors here and all my good friends. Uh, and. Uh, my, my issue today is to sort of bring up um, the issue of the landfill that we have visited based on a letter by our city council. I salute Mayor Bob Huber and uh, City Councilman Becerra and the rest of the council for addressing this issue with regards to the shredded or auto shredded, auto shredded um, waste that went into the landfill. Um, I have some concerns that I'd like to bring up to the board because I believe the board should take a much active, a much more active role in this. Certainly, knowing the history of uh, Supervisor Bennett, Supervisor Parks, and, and certainly my good friend John Zaragoza, um, this is an issue that's very important to Simi Valley, which has sort of been swept under the rug. And that is that three months after the expansion has been approved, there is a letter asking for a grand jury investigation on waste management and the uh, dumping of hazardous tox, um, toxic metals into our landfill. Um, 
after the hurried landfill expansion approval, uh, I should say approval support by this city council in Simi Valley and a $100 million guarantee, we now come up with a dilemma of a $2.9 million settlement to a lawsuit charging that there was illegal dumping into the Simi Valley landfill uh, of auto shredding. That's a very serious offense, and I'll give you a quote of Doug Cochran, who I know very well, because I used to be a consultant to waste management. And one of the reasons I'm no longer a consultant to them is because I don't believe in their environmental concerns. But in this particular case, Doug Cochran says, Waste Management, and who's Director of Special Projects, said three weeks ago, evidence that hazardous waste had been dumped at the Simi Valley landfill was a very serious concern of his. Well, it's got to be more than a very serious concern. We had some very serious concerns on this issue before the expansion. Um, and if that's not good enough, when it comes to um, health and safety, I don't think $100 million to the city of Simi or to that matter to the county of, of uh, Ventura, and I know it was much more than that, uh, is enough to be, uh, not be concerned about the health and safety of the people of Simi Valley. And I think this has been the letter that we got back from Mr. Powers, and I understand what he wrote, basically said that there was not enough evidence based on um, – the sections in state codes that there was hazardous dumping. That isn't really the question here. The question was there toxic substances dumped into the Simi Valley landfill. I really asked this board to take a very active role in pushing this. We asked for a grand jury investigation, I should say the council did, and that was, of course, denied. But the people up in Sacramento, the Department of California Integrated Waste Management Board, believes differently as to what this might be. And I would ask that those members here on this board, and especially our city supervisor, Mr. Foy, take a look into this and, and ask for an investigation that's serious and takes care of everything. A simple answer by uh, management of waste management that, gee, this is something pretty serious, we're going to look into it, is not enough. So I ask this board to please take a serious look at this. They now have their expansion, and this is what they do across the nation. And I think it's very important that we take a look at this and do what's appropriate and not simply sit by. I thank you very much for your time. And I, I thank you, Mr. D'Antona, for bringing this forward regarding the past actions of uh, putting treated auto shredder waste in the waste management landfill. Um, I know our um, CEO here could comment on that, but it is something that we will look into. So, Mr. Powers? Yes, thank you, Chair Parks, and <clears throat> thank you, Mr. D'Antona, for your concerns. It is something that we take very seriously. And uh, just so you know, as I said in my letter, I attached a copy of the uh, a review that's been done uh, by our Environmental Health Department at the county. And that, just so you know, that review is ongoing. Uh, right now, what they have determined is that according to the State Department of, of Toxic Substances, uh, this, there is not a violation, uh, but this review is ongoing, and we're open to additional information. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, and I hope I appreciate the uh, we recently appointed Alice Sterling from your community who has taken on this cause to our Air Pollution Control Board Advisory Committee. So it's nice to get her voice heard. But thank you for your comments okay. this evening. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, our next item on our agenda then after public comments, because I don't believe we have any other people from the public who wish to comment at this time, would be uh, going to our county council, <coughs> county council to make an announcement of the closed session that we had. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I had one announcement in our closed session on the case California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection et al. versus Southern California Gas Company. LA Superior Court case number BC 447106, the Ventura County Fire Protection District, which is a party in the case, agreed to a settlement of $240,544.36 as its full cost recovery of its expenses in fighting the Cessnon fire. In exchange for that, the fire district will uh, release all of its other claims. And the yeah. vote was five to zero. Thank you. And that gets us funding to pay for the work that our fire department did in fighting that fire. And then we'll go to our next agenda items. And these, this then goes to our regular agenda. Uh, and that would be our item number 25, which is, ah, I apologize. Let's go to board comments and then go to 
the regular agenda item. And I'm going to start to my left, as I always do, with uh, Mr. Foy. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank the city uh, for allowing us to be here and the hard work that they put into it, uh, along with Roberta making this all work. It's, uh, it doesn't always happen, uh, easily as it looks. So also, I'd like to um, say that this is something that we've been doing. As Mayor said, we've done this three times here already, and I know the other supervisors have gone around the other parts of the county in order to bring the public, gets the opportunity to see what goes on in their, in their local county government. You also have the opportunity in your city governments. It always happen at night, but it doesn't happen that way for county. And so our, our goal here is that you would have the opportunity to see what we do, have the opportunity to talk and express your opinions on things, because a lot of times during the middle of the day, we start at 8.30 and you're at work usually, or you're doing something else. So it's an opportunity, and I want to uh, say thank you for the city for opening it up and, and to the public, That's and this is what our goal is here. So again, it's great to be here. Look forward to any other things, uh, questions. I know there's another card and some other items that will come up, people speaking. But uh, those are my comments. And I also want to say to our assistant city manager here, Laura Bashan, who was in a car accident, we hope for a speedy recovery for that. So thank you. And again, thank you, Mike Sedell and city councilman. We have Barbara Williams and Mike Judd up there too. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I know Ms. Williamson has a card in for later too. Uh, Supervisor Long, would you like to give us some comments? Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you to the mayor and to the city for uh, opening your doors and welcoming, welcoming us here. It's always good to, uh, I always underestimate how long a drive it is from the government center. And he does this every week. So I know what Linda and I do. Please I can. do. <laughs> I do now. Um, but it's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, for making the arrangements work. Uh, and also to our um, inspirational speakers um, and the stories you shared and the passion you shared that it truly was inspirational. And I, I, I know Simi Valley has been um, a leader for a while now on the um, task force on homelessness and, the, and with the task force that you have here in place. Um, great to have that update on all of the work that's underway and the numbers that you're serving. And it's, um, and, and it's a powerful message that a community can wrap its arms around homelessness and make a difference um, as we continue to work <coughs> excuse me on the um, update to the 10-year plan uh, regionally countywide um, we could not have made the progress nor could we look at making more progress without the cities and the community in each city embracing that we can make a difference there so really appreciated the update and and the information you've left us <coughs> I'd like to um, also uh, update a couple things with the board. One is that um, this uh, past weekend I, I was able to attend the Child Deve Development Resources fourth annual celebration of the child event in Camarillo at the Camarillo Ranch House. There were over 3,000 people there, children and families. It was, it was a delight to see and it's excellent work by CDCR that they do for all of us countywide and providing services to the underserved and um, really helping out families who need assistance but um, as importantly the, the children and the Head Start programs and the other programs that they oversee and they um, wanted me to extend to all the board members their appreciation of support for their work. So I want to let you know that. And um, <clears throat> also, uh, I think that uh, some of this um, may have reached out to this part of the county, uh, and I'll say this for the board members who have received e emails, there, there have been in the last couple weeks, um, perhaps a little longer, some concerns with um, uh, airplane uh, Point Magoo Air Base, Naval Base, Ventura County air flights over the community and lots of noise accompanying that. Um, in the last couple weeks there's just been a perfect storm of just operational things that have gone on at the base that, um, at, at that really brought about those noise complaints and Captain uh, James uh, McHugh had a letter to the editor in the paper that addressed some of that and uh, what wasn't addressed in there that and I know um, you, you may remember that a few months ago there was a, um, uh, a, a landing at um, Magoo that didn't quite go right and um, there was an issue with a plane crash in, at Magoo that um, did a, quite a bit of damage to runway 321 and there's currently restoration and repair of that underway and as a result of that that runway is closed for um, any air traffic and so that has of course pushed things onto the other runway and creates some additional noise um, 
patterns and, and trafficking. So uh, just to say uh, to, to those who may be listening or raise those concerns that um, uh, the Navy and Captain McHugh is very aware of the community concerns with this. They are doing the very best they can to stay on top of it, to inform the community when there's additional exercises that take place and certainly when there's any um, incidences that would change the traffic pattern. But um, uh, he's very aware of it, and, and we have good communications with him, as does our, um, I see Todd, uh, our administrator at Camarillo Airport, who actually sees both our, oversees both our airports. Um, so any communications can certainly be uh, linked through that or directly into Naval Base Ventura County. And we encourage you to do that. And one other public announcement, um, those on <coughs> this side of the county, we are, we being um, Supervisor Zaragoza and myself, along with the District Attorney and with the South Coast Realtors Association, is holding a town hall meeting. It's in South Oxnard on Thursday night at 7 o'clock to focus on fraud in real estate, fraud in mortgages, and the, um, uh, ex the propensity of what we're seeing in the, in the, in the um, scam artists who are coming into our county. And certainly we're, we, we know there are cases on the east end of the county as, as well as the west end. Um, the district attorney's um, uh, fr uh, fraud um, uh, division, uh, real estate fraud division, is actively working dealing with, with the fraud cases that are brought to their attention. Um, but the uh, bad guys seem to say one step ahead of us in these hard economic times when people are, uh, are at the risk of losing their home for a variety of reasons. Um, and then someone comes in and tries to defraud them, um, indicating that they can rescue them from that fraud um, and, and do so with, certainly with uh, the worst of intentions. Anyway, this town hall is to hold, uh, to reach out to the community, to invite them in, to see what resources are available to them, to educate them on real estate fraud and the scamming that's going on, and to really raise the, their knowledge so that they can raise their voices and be heard and, and not be um, defrauded. Um, there are uh, statistically 2.2 .2 million, .2 million Californians who are underwater with their mortgages currently in the state. Um, we are, uh, have six hot spots in the state for real estate um, mortgage uh, foreclosures, and we nationally, 30% uh, of homeowners are two years late in their mortgages. We're all in tough times. So anything we can do to reach out for both the educational side of it and resources, um, I, I believe will be a benefit to all of us. So I'm happy Supervisor Zaragoza and I will be putting that town hall meeting on. And uh, lastly, and if you'd like information, certainly can get that to you. Lastly, to adjourn in memory, I think that's the last of my comments, to adjourn in memory of folks from the uh, third district, um, uh, and I won't go through that list, I'll submit it to the record. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Long. Supervisor Zaragoza, you have board comment? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I also want to thank uh, the residents uh, of your beautiful city, here in Simi Valley, and also thank the uh, the mayor and the council members for your invitation. It's just a beautiful city. Every time I come by the 118 heading to Burbank, you know, I just look both sides and see how beautiful it is here. <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to share is uh, with you, I'm uh, a yellow jacket, graduated from Oxnard High School a couple of years ago. And the other day I got inducted to the Hall of Fame, and I just could not believe this. The um, Hall of Fame has start, was started by uh, one of the principals at Oxford High School for individuals that have done outstanding work or superstars in, in football or baseball. Or, or, uh, and I joined um, the first inductee who was uh, Jack O'Connell, our former state superintendent of schools. He was the Hall of Fame inductee uh, last year. He uh, was the first one, and this year I and, and 27 other individuals got um, inducted to the Hall of Fame, and I joined with people like like uh, Ken McMullen and other superstars. I'm not a superstar by no means. The reason they, I got uh, nominated was because of my support to, for education and also my civic participation and also to help, uh, help in the community of, uh, of Oxnard and Ventura County. So I'm very honored to have been inducted to the Hall of Fame for Oxnard. In addition to this, uh, last week we also uh, did the groundbreaking for our boat, uh, boating center over at the harbor. We're going to be working with the Channel Islands University and the boating center. We're going to have quite a few uh, uh, displays, and we're going to actually teach the kids how to use boats and work at the harbor. And it's going to be a great, great uh, program. We just broke ground on that. 
And we had uh, Martin Smith as one of the, uh, we call him Mr. Oxnard. He's the one that really started quite a few businesses in Oxnard. Their foundation donated a million dollars that, that day, you know, on behalf of that boating center, plus the other four or five million it takes to, to build that boating center. In addition to that, I also uh, attended the Tri-Counties Labor Leader of the Year Award, Steve Weiner and Vern Northrup, that, uh, that were honored uh, there at Oxnard at the Marriott uh, Hotel. In addition to, I attended a Victory Outreach gra uh, graduation ceremony, and Shannon, you reminded me of what they talked about there at the, there was 400 individuals or parents and sisters and brothers who were there to see this graduate, some 25 graduates that graduated from coming out of prison, from, from narcotics to now being leaders of, of the community to try to, to help kids that got in trouble like you were sharing uh, earlier. And it was just inspirational to, to, to speak to all those folks and what they were sharing too. There was 400 plus people there and they talked about homelessness, they talked about individuals that got in, uh, in uh, prostitution and, and narcotics and so forth. So your message today was really excellent, you know, and I really, really could feel that, you know, that your sincerity. And also Dr. Um, um, uh, Kurt uh, Fredrickson, I think when you shared about homelessness, you know, we had a, a black and white uh, fundraiser just the other day in Oxnard about homelessness to try to raise money for our individuals, not only in Oxnard, but also in Ventura County. So I want to thank you for that and what you're doing here in Simi Valley. I think this is universal throughout, especially now with our economy that we have quite a few families that are, that are homeless, homeless and quite a few people that are looking for food stamps and quite a few people that would never think of even looking for assistance. That's happening now. And as Supervisor Long mentioned too, we're gonna have that, uh, that um, fraud, uh, uh, con not convention, the uh, town hall meeting that we're gonna have here uh, in a couple of days. And this fraud is not hitting just the poor people, it's hitting people with that, that have million, two million, three million dollar homes. So it's, it's a universal uh, concern that uh, we have with uh, mortgage fraud. So with that in mind, I just would like to sh uh, also uh, adjourn uh, in memory of those folks on this list. And thank you so much again to Simi Valley for allowing us to be here today. Thank you, Supervisor Zaragoza. Supervisor Bennett, you have some board comments? Uh, thank you very much. It, uh, it, it is always a pleasure to come to uh, these meetings in Simi Valley. This is the third one. Um, you know, when you think about it, we're so far away, and I think, uh, Simi Valley, when I get here, there is just a special atmosphere in this community and it comes out uh, every, every time and it already came out. The two inspirational speakers I think just capture what uh, I see over and over again in people in Simi Valley. Uh, it is not, um, uh, it's not something that's overlooked that the Simi Valley churches are the churches that have set the model for how we go about trying to use churches to recruit foster homes in Ventura County. But it is, uh, uh, and, and, and out of that, so somebody got going uh, with the missionary church here in uh, Simi Valley, and that church became a model for moving forward. And then out of that became a comment that was made here at this board, and then out of that came your movement. And I see that over and over again, and I, I just want to say that uh, Simi Valley is, is truly a city that uh, embraces that sense of community uh, and, and going after it, and so it's always inspiring to come down here. So I, I, I really appreciate it a lot. Uh, very quickly, um, a lot of things happened. They've already been mentioned. I'll mention a few other things that uh, uh, I was able to attend um, uh, in addition to the what the other board members, but uh, we had a recognition for uh, Laura Taylor, um, uh, middle school teacher in Ventura on October 12th. And we had a, a great meeting at the uh, River Park Community uh, to talk about the levy um, and had uh, a really good attendance and I think a really good response by the community. Um, Nordoff High School Teacher of the Year, then the Channel Islands um, groundbreaking for the BISC uh, to alert people out here here in Simi Valley. Soon we will have a boating instruction safety center at Channel Islands Harbor. The boys and girls clubs of Simi Valley could go there, get free lessons, get free uh, exposure 
to uh, all of the joys and stimulation that come from learning about navigation and getting out to the Channel Islands, things that most low-income youth do not have adequate uh, exposure to. Um, and um, the St. Vincent's de Paul uh, black and white dinner that Supervisor Zaragoza uh, mentioned was to raise money to open the winter homeless shelter uh, for residents in Ventura uh, and Oxnard. Uh, and then last night, uh, we rolled out to the neighbors in uh, Ventura uh, the new uh, footprint for the hospital. Uh, and I'm really pleased to compliment our staff. Uh, we started with a room full of uh, very upset neighbors a year ago. And last night, we had five neighbors there uh, that essentially asked two questions and walked out very pleased. And that's a compliment to Mike Powers, uh, his leadership. Um, um, and uh, Dr. Gonzalez and everybody else on the staff. And I wanted our board in particular to know that our board took a position of identifying what kind of parameters we wanted. Uh, we wanted to be a, uh, a good neighbor. Our staff followed through on that, and we ended up with, uh, with very good results uh, from that, that standpoint. So I um, wanted to uh, pass those things on, and thank you very much. Uh, for did this you, opportunity. Okay. And did you do a uh, close and honor? I have no adjourned okay. memories pleasant. That's a positive thing. Um, my uh, brief board comments, I was able to uh, attend the fire department's promotional ceremony in, uh, last Thursday, and it was a delight to be able to participate and honor uh, our wonderful members of our fire department that were able to promote all the way up to uh, a battalion chief and on. So, And then also, uh, I think, a uh, Three, four of us attended the uh, sixth annual Support the Veterans Reception honoring Michael Bradbury on Sunday, and that was nice to see everyone there and and also uh, hear from uh, some a wounded veteran that uh, really is an outstanding citizen, and uh, you just really have to be proud to have these people representing our county. Uh, just a couple interesting facts I like to share. For example, <laughs> on this day in 1867, the United States formally took possession of Alaska after purchasing the territory from Russia for $7.2 million, or less than two cents an acre. And uh, let's see, in 1892, the first long-distance telephone line between Chicago and New York City was open. And most importantly, today, October 18th, Mark's National Chocolate Cupcake Day. <laughs> it's part of the National American Food Holiday, and it reminds me that we're also having a cupcake open house at my a new office on uh, October 28th for the public from 2 to 4. That's the last Friday in November, and hope uh, the public and, and staff will come and, and see the, the new facility, which uh, also features a separate uh, office for our veteran services so they can come and, and meet with veterans in our area as well as a, uh, a community meeting room where the community can come and, and use the room, community organizations uh, who need a, a place to have their meetings. So it's nice to be able to offer that too in a great location. Uh, with that, I would also uh, just ask that uh, we close in honor of the people on my list. It includes um, three veterans, Dennis Edgar Gass, who is an Army veteran and also worked for the Canal Recreation and Park District, John Robert Mack, with a, who is an Air Force veteran, Stanton Lowe, a Navy veteran, and then a gentleman named Frank Hyde, who is a renowned horseman. So ask that the board close in honor of those people. And that concludes my comments. And at this time, then, we can go to our first time certain item. This is item number 19, our 655 time certain. And this is to receive and file a presentation by Royal High School Assistant Drum Major Justin Klotzel. That's his name? Colts. Justin Colts. This is this is kind of this is this is a very special special thing. We have Justin back here. And uh, this is a young man that is the assistant drum major over at Royal High School. But what makes him special? He's really good. <laughs> and he's so good. He's just one out of six people that have been selected in the United States to go and perform in front of the Queen. So what, but you know, in order to understand what a uh, drum major is, I just found something out. Our assistant CEO, Matt Carroll, was a drum major. Oh. 
So I'm going to ask Matt to come down real quick and explain what a drum major is. This, this is Matt Carroll. He's our assistant CEO. He just told me back there that he was a drum major, and he knows the pressures that drum majors go under. So Matt, give us a little bit. Don't I put him on the spot. I don't lead into this, but uh, I, I want to share some, some insights. Uh, first of all, as, as I was drum major at uh, Chatsworth High School back in the mid-'70s, and we had about 200 folks in our band and about 300 folks in our, in our um, <clears throat> cheer squads and our, and our song major squads, and it was quite a, quite a big deal. Um, I thought it was a big deal. My wife told me she would have never dated me if she found out I was a drummer in high school. So my recommendation is don't lead with that until you've gone on a first date. In fact, I told Supervisor Foy that uh, uh, I was the head of technology for the county and I was known as the head geek. And she says, well, you were the head geek when you were the head of the drum major. So uh, don't listen to those folks uh, because, as you know, um, being a drum major is all about leadership. There's very rarely an individual out there, when you're on the football team, you have the whole football team around you. But when you're the drum major and you're throwing your mace up in the air and you're leading a group of folks who'd rather not be led as young teenagers, uh, it's a real challenging, challenging experience. It's a sobering experience and there's a lot of pressure on you. But I will say my uh, ROTC scholarships, my opportunities to get into uh, uh, certain programs in the military and all that uh, was greatly enhanced by being a drum major. It really shows the leadership and the acumen there. So it's a character builder and it is a responsibility. And, you, and the, Although you have that band around you, it's you out in front and, uh, and it's all on your shoulders. So uh, to be one of six to go on, on such an international uh, adventure is, is quite a tribute. So congratulations. And he's obviously much better than I was. He was. <laughs> Justin, why don't you come on down? And again, he's going to be there on January 1st uh, performing this 2012 coming up. And again, one of six. Give us some, some words, Justin, maybe a little demonstration. All right. Um, just a small correction. Um, it, was, there was six at, um, it was six out of 100 at the drum major camp that I went to. Last year, there were 10 total that went to London. Um, I'm not sure how many will go this year, but there were other but, camps. Okay. So, but either way, you're going to be one of the, the, the few that are going. Yes. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. So, yep, he pretty much hit on the nose what I do as a drum major. Um, it's stressful. Um, this year, I'm not up in front. We have our drum major up in front. Next year, it will be me. Um, yeah, so I went to a, a drum major camp over the summer uh, with, my, with the drum major this year. And it was this. It was a four-day intensive um, training session where we learned um, we learned um, better techniques, better ways to lead the band, um, and enha enhance the abilities that we already um, had. Um, so, at camp, I enrolled in classes like advanced mace, advanced conducting, and then a, a variety of leadership classes and. Um, and so that's where I learned, uh, learned all the techniques. Um, and then throughout the camp, I was tested on, um, tested on my abilities. Um, we had a mace evaluation, a parade evaluation, and a conducting evaluation. Um, and I received a superior on my mace evaluation, a excellent on my parade evaluation, and a superior in my conducting evaluation. Um, yeah, so that was, I mean, it was, um, it was it was a it was a surprise. I mean, I had just I learned these um, I learned everything that was about to be a drum major. I mean, from the past drum major who was amazing. But um, I I was new to this. I was nervous. It was the first time I ever been to camp, and I I didn't expect to do as well as I did. Um, but so so throughout camp uh, I was tested, and then at the end of camp um, there was an award ceremony. And I was awarded a superior plaque um, for my uh, leadership techniques, abilities that I showed at camp. Um, and so, I mean, that that alone was enough to make me like enough to put me on cloud nine. I was I was I was ecstatic. Um, and so, I mean, I would have been happy to go home with that. But um, so, and then they called six of us up to the front, um, and after a long pause. They finally announced, "Give a round of applause for your 2011 All-American Drum Majors." And we were we were at attention, so I didn't I couldn't move, but my heart just did this <laughs> jump inside of my chest. I was like, "No way, it's me!" And so um, I would. It was something that 
I was hoping to get my senior year. Our previous drum, drum major had, um, had gone the previous year. Um, and so it was something that I aspired to, that I wanted to do eventually, but I was not expecting it in the least uh, my junior year. So it was something that I was extremely happy about. Wow. That's, uh, how old are you? I am 16. Wow. You, you speak well, too. You're a very confident man. As you talk about the leadership, I can see why people look at these kind of young men as leaders. And, and your classes are on leadership. Yes. How often do young men like you get the opportunity to do that leadership? And that's, that's tremendous. Yeah, yeah. You, you, your family's got to be proud. Mom and dad got to be proud. So congratulations. Are you going to give us a little bit of a demonstration? Yeah, sure, I can. Uh, this is my mace. This is my practice mace. My real shiny mace that I will use in December is on the way. It's being shipped. But um, I don't have much room to do all the fancy stuff in class. Yeah, don't hurt somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but I can show you the basics. Um, so I was taught when I first tried out for drum major, there's just your basic spin. Spinning, um, and they teach you that. They teach you everything in the opposite direction, um, and then it gets more complicated. Little rifle tossing, making those people in front of you a little nervous. Yeah. Saying. <laughs> Thumb rolls, um, different, and it just gets it gets more and more and more complicated. There's, I mean, at camp I learned tosses, um, neck wraps with me. Body, a bunch of crazy stuff. Um, one of the techniques that I can do in here is just a finger roll where it just goes. You remember that, Matt, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, if I had more room, I could show you my routine that I use to get a superior in my mace evaluation, but um, I don't quite have the room in here. But, um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I do as a drum major, and that is to get the honor of. You guys make Scott walk down. We got, we got something here from the Board of Supervisors. Just congratulate you and uh, your trip and everything else. Now, you want to give that to Matt? Let's see if Matt can try. <laughs> you have to clear the room. <laughs> Good, you got it too, everybody. <laughs> One thing about it, you know, he's got to pay for his own trip, so I know that there was something. What was that, if he wanted to help, people wanted to help? Um, you could write a check to either him or me, to um, us. Right. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> that information is there. You can write money. I forget what the name was. What was the name of it? It's a donation. It's a donation, but uh, he has to go. But anyway, congratulations. We didn't want to pass up the opportunity when we saw that you were doing that, so I appreciate it. I know your mom was going... What are we going to go do here tonight? So, but it would be just great. So, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you it. so much for that. All the best for luck to you. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations. Uh, congratulations and, and good luck. Say hi to the Queen for us. <laughs> Uh, and this, uh, at this time now, I think we've hit the 7 o'clock hour, so we can go to item 20, which is a public hearing that we're going to have. Um, not quite as exciting as the last presentation, but before we do our 7 o'clock, we're going to take a brief break because I've been asked to do that. Am I right? So we'll be back here in uh, five minutes. Maybe let's make it 10 minutes. It'll be more realistic. Thank you. Welcome back to our Board of Supervisors meeting of October 18th. Um, and we are going to go now to our 7 p.m. time certain. And this is uh, Christy Madden's going to help us through with a CDBG and home investment grants. And I have no dumb drum major routines. I'm not going to sing now for that you. Been but but because promise. the drum major you bring up, we have some people of action here. Remember we said we got to raise some money? Yeah. These veterans went out and all of a sudden raised money. We just found they raised $128 for this guy. Congratulations. Very, very awesome. 
Okay, well, my name is Christy Madden with the County Executive Office, and um, tonight we are here to conduct a public hearing. As you will recall, when we came to your board in May, we uh, submitted recommendations for our HUD funding, and that included the CDBG and the home funds that are both subjects of tonight's item. Um, in May, the city of Moore Park's share of our entitlement grant, as you know, we share our entitlement money with the five small cities, and Moore Park is one of those partners. Moore Park's funding was not allocated to a project because the project that they were going to fund was something that the, the county subsequently did not recommend funding for. So what we did was to conduct a new solicitation for the CDBG funding from the city of Moore Park, about $148,000. And Moore Park had recommended that we do a solicitation for economic development projects. The Economic Development Collaborative of Ventura County, EDCVC, submitted two applications for funding for economic development, one a technical assistance and one a loan program. Um, staff also was directed back in May to look at the expenditure rates of our CDBG uh, non-public service funding so that we could ensure that we are on track to meet the expenditure requirements from HUD. HUD looks in April of each year at how much money um, their grantees have in their line of credit. We're not allowed to have more than one and a half times our annual funding sitting in our line of credit unexpended by April. So staff looked at all of the projects that we had on the books and found about $100,000 of funding uh, from projects that had been completed or knew that they weren't going to need all of their funding. So when we were looking at EDCVC's uh, application for the Moore Park program, one of the attachments in that um, application was a listing of the unemployment rates throughout the county. And when staff looked at those unemployment rates, we discovered that the Santa Clara River Valley actually has the highest unemployment rates anywhere in the county of Ventura. Fillmore's unemployment, these are July of 2011 numbers, was 14.6%, uh, Santa Paula was 17.4%, and Piru has an unemployment rate of 18.4%. So it's a, it's a very dire situation out in that area. So we approached the EDCVC and asked them if they could expand the services that they were proposing for Moore Park and do a comparable program for the Santa Clara River Valley. The EDCVC has extensive experience in um, managing and tracking the expenditure of funds and job creation they have been managing the economic development um, administration's revolving loan fund for quite some time, so they have lots of procedures in place to track. Uh, HUD has been placing increased emphasis, as I think has virtually every federal department, on jobs, jobs, jobs. So we see this as a really great opportunity to try and leverage some local resources and, and generate some jobs through the CDBG funding for um, the EDCBC. The City of Moore Park did review and recommend funding for both of these projects, so they do have Moore Park's endorsement. Also in May, um, your board allocated some of our home um, funding for projects. There were two applications that we had received that uh, were not generating new housing units, so staff had recommended that we solicit um, a new applications later in the year. At that time, we didn't have a state budget. There were a lot of things that were in flux. We were hoping that once the state budget was solidified, some of the funding sources that are commonly used for housing development would be in place, and we might get stronger applications for home projects. We did a new solicitation, the same two applicants, both of whom are here. Um, Cabrillo and Santa Paula Housing Authority submitted applications for virtually the same thing that they had applied for before. Uh, the message is there's really nothing new on the immediate horizon because of requirements in the home program that you have to spend the funding within two years of getting your uh, contract. It's very difficult to um, 
to get projects moving. Some projects take as long as five years from the time that they start until the time they're completed. So rather than risk losing the home funds being um, absorbed back by HUD and losing them from our line of credit, we are recommending that we go ahead and split that home funding between the two applicants. They're using the funds to pay for, to pay down deferred uh, developer fees or pay back loans that the organizations have taken on themselves. And while we recognize that that action in, in and of itself doesn't generate new housing units, we know that those organizations are both very committed to the development of housing and that ultimately that will be used for future housing development. So that concludes my presentation. Um, Recommended that you open the public hearing and uh, subsequently approve staff's recommendations. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, the meeting uh, public hearing is open. I don't think we have any comment cards or on item 20 itself. I do have, excuse me, uh, Bernardo P Perez followed by Bruce Densley. If you'd like to come up and uh, I see you're both in support. <laughs> Good evening, um, Madam Chair, Supervisors, Mike Powers. Um, I'm sorry Steve is gone because I want to just open up that uh, as great a community as Simi Valley is, and I've been a neighbor, I live in Moore Park for over 40 years. we got a lot going for us in Moore Park as well, and so maybe the next time you come out this way, <laughs> you can cut your commute down just a little bit and stop over in, in Moore Park. Well, we'll be there next year. All Every right. other year we flip back and forth. Right. So. Thank you. Um, I, am, I am here in support of staff's recommendation and um, Paseo Santa Barbara, which will now be known in the future as the Rodney Fernandez Gardens, uh, has a long and long, a long story to it. If it would only take five years for some of these projects, that would be a, a, a move forward. But uh, I just want to clarify one thing. From the beginning, we had always envisioned this as a multi-funding multi-year funding for our project. So at this point in time, it doesn't generate any new units, but with the limited resources, it does take multi-year funding. So uh, it's a great project. It's a strong project. Um, we're moving families in now, as a matter of fact. And so you will be receiving Save the Date uh, information for our open house and grand opening on December 9th, a Friday, midday, and then Saturday, uh, December 10th. Uh, the open house is primarily for our partners and staff. And by the way, staff, I just uh, must commend staff because uh, the dynamics are changing, the program requirements are changing for CDBG and home. And I'm not a drum major, but staff is certainly putting us all through our paces. And uh, we appreciate that technical support, and uh, we're looking forward to an upcoming mandatory hearing. And um, again, uh, appreciate your continued support and look forward to your uh, favorable action on the staff recommendation. Any questions? Thank no you. questions. Nice that you naming it after Rodney. That's a nice tribute to him. It's Madam good work. Chair, and I just like um, Bernard. I'd like to commend Cabrillo for their, your excellent work. You know, and, and Rodney too. And I know that he's uh, retired, but uh, yeah. thank you for the good work for the community. Thank you. And thank you. We don't do it alone. So thank, thank you. you all. And uh, Mr. Sansley. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Powers, staff, Bruce Stensley at the Economic Development Collaborative. Just want to say a couple of things. First, thank you very much to the county and to the good work that Christy and her staff have done. I was exhausted just reading the title and the recommendations in the board letter, um, but we really are appreciative of the piece of it that does some amendment to include some economic development um, detail in the local plan. That's good for now. It's good for moving ahead, and we're really excited about that. I also want to express our appreciation to our partners um, collaborators in the cities of Moore Park and in Fillmore and Santa Paula and Piru and the Santa Clara Valley. We're really excited about this for a couple of reasons. Number one, it allows us with this new infusion of funds for both lending and for small business consulting to not only build on our existing capacity in those services, but to concentrate them in a more specific way in outreach and direct service both to Moore Park and the Santa Clara River Valley. Um, we're going to focus those efforts on job creation. We're excited to do this. We'd be happy to answer any questions about our strategy, and we'll be happy to come back and tell you how well it goes after we move ahead, should it go that way. Thank you. Um, thank you. I would very much like to know it's uh, nice to be able to put funding that will go to job creation, and they've identified in the report um, specifically 14 jobs here, nine jobs here, et cetera. And so it's, it's nice to see that. 
Um, and I'm glad that you offered to come back. I would like a follow-up and see Absolutely. how did you do that, you know. So by providing funds to the businesses, mm -hmm. that will translate to them having a better ability then to hire employees, and hopefully they'll be long-term employees, not just funded with the grant fund. Is that right? No, they'll be long-term. That's the goal. We're not, we're not subsidizing any work. What we're going to do is work with businesses to either get the access to capital or the resources to improve their efficiency in their operations so they've got a better bottom line and be able to hire more staff, be more productive generally. That's our goal. It's technical assistance and lending to do that. And then, you know, I just think of this as an opportunity, too, to, um, you know, get double benefits. So there are things that our community needs, everything from, you know, bridge building, for example, or, uh, you know, being able to, to get something that uh, our community needs out of these or you know, maybe some green jobs. Is there anything specific that you're looking at in the type of businesses that you're going to outreach to to create these jobs? So, you know, there are certainly some jobs that are needed out there in the community. And, you know, That's right. With, with this particular fund, we didn't identify any specific industry, sector, or occupations. Um, it's very difficult with the small amount of money. I will identify that in a separate contract with the county's Workforce Investment Board and Human Services Agency, we're doing some work right now to target three industry sectors, primarily around manufacturing, um, sustainable green jobs, and healthcare, allied health industry jobs across the board, as we all know, tends to be a gap in those areas. Um, manufacturing, it's very interesting. It's still a vibrant piece of the economy, and while there is still 10% unemployment out there. We hear routinely from the manufacturers that with the increase in technology, they just don't have the applicants that have the skills to do those jobs. We're helping them identify funds to train workers and fill them. With this, we have not identified specific targets. Um, we're going to go out there and we're going to find out where the opportunities and the business demand side are for more labor and work to fill them. Okay, and I would just uh, put that in your ear then, and the idea sure. that these could be jobs that can also help us uh, as a community in terms of, like I said, we've got like a hundred bridges that aren't up to standard. Yeah. We need, you know, <laughs> we need to get people out there and 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 working on those projects too. So uh, that's just one example, and certainly the ones that the Workforce Investment Board are looking at are those jobs where there are gaps. So uh, good luck to you, and and do come back. Thank you. Thank you, Su Supervisor Zaragoza. I also want to thank uh, Bruce you know, for example, also EDCBC too, and uh, and to help the Santa Clara Valley uh, small cities there, it's important. 17% is a tremendous amount of uh, unemployment, and uh, you do help a lot of businesses, you know, and with uh, job uh, opportunities and and also with uh, with monies and so forth. So there's a lot more to be said about EDBC than just this small project, you know. So. Maybe one of these days you can give us a, a full report on what's happening there at the EDB. I'd be happy to come and do a, a full comprehensive picture of what we're able to do. As Bernardo mentioned, though, it's in partnership with key players around the county, and we try to leverage those partnerships. And then you have Bill Camarillo and Bernardo working on green jobs and so forth. Absolutely. Too, so. For a big event on Friday morning. A little plug there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. We do uh, enjoy partnering with you and being able to see the fruits of that labor. It's very nice with our labor force. Uh, with that, do we have a motion to uh, accept like to the move the recommended action? Appreciate the work. Supervisor uh, along made the motion. I believe Supervisor Foy seconded it. And uh, what we can do now is all say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. <laughs> and that passes 4-0. And uh, thank you for the uh, coming up and speaking. Uh, we'll go uh, now to our 715 time certain. This is uh, regarding uh, Cypress Street property. I know I do have at least one speaker card, more than one speaker card for this, and uh, we'll start with our staff report. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Powers. Uh, the item before you is a request to find that the old fire station 43 in the Santa Susana Knowles area is no longer required for county use. Uh, request that you approve the transfer of the property to the city of Simi Valley and authorize the director of public works to uh, execute the deed on behalf of the county. Um, because of the location of this property and the improvements that are on there, uh, it doesn't really suit any other county need. It's been determined that the city of Simi Valley would make the best use of it. Government code allows you to negotiate any terms you choose when you want to transfer the property to the city. Thank you. 
Um, any other questions you want to? Are there any through? questions from the board? Uh, shall we go to our public comments? Okay. So uh, our first speaker I have is uh, our council member Barbara Williamson from the city of Simi Valley, followed by city manager Mike Sedell. Good morning, Good Chairman uh, Parks and members of the board. Um, before I tell you what I'm really here for, I just want to give you some pamphlets. Um, this is our uh, Task Force on Homelessness Directory of Social Services, and it's our March 2012 edition. Um, unbeknownst to Supervisor Long, she probably got the City of Simi Valley started on this from a, a committee meeting that she had in 1992 or 3, wanting homeless services for the county. I attended that meeting. I came back to the City of Simi Valley, and now we have this huge task force that has done so many wonderful things in our community. So I'd like for you to take a look at that. It's, it's got a wealth of information in it. I can't tell you how excited I am here tonight. Um, this item that you have on your agenda uh, about the um, fire station in the Knolls, uh, the city has very big interest in, in obtaining this property. Um, it's the intent of the city council, once it is turned over to us, to give it over to the veterans in our community. Uh, local veterans, uh, retired and active. This could be a place for them to go and to hold meetings, to gather and to discuss things that they want to discuss, um, to play basketball on the court that is there. It's going to be a wonderful place for them to be. And you know, there is, you know, we have a lot of places in our community for kids, uh, for soccer, for baseball, but our veterans, you know, they're kind of almost homeless. So this is going to be an incredible use for them. So I am here to ask you to please support staff recommendation on this item. Thank you so very, very much. Oh, thank you. How wonderful. What a great uh, use of the fire station. If we uh, end up having to ever close our Lake Sherwood fire station, that's something I'd like to do too, is offer it to our veterans. You need a meeting place. And I, I'd like to get them a cannon out in front too. Can you do that? <laughs> Not an operable cannon. <laughs> okay. Uh, our next speaker card is Mike Sedell, uh, followed by Marie Mason. Is there any questions? Uh, does the board have any questions? Mr. Sedell is here for questions. Um, is this something that you vetted with your um, community up there in the Knolls? Yep. Yes. Early stages, yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Mike, come down for a little bit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I know, Mike, that you've uh, talked to, um, and your whole council, I think, has talked about this this whole situation and and what what you have the opportunity to hopefully do with this. Sure, the, the council uh, has discussed that, in, in the intent, uh, as Councilman Williamson cited, was is basically to make it a, a low key, low impact facility in the in the community, but to have a facility where the veterans can go to have meetings, to have arrange transportation which may go to Ventura to Los Angeles to have larger facilities, health facilities uh, that they may need to get to, uh, to really have a, a place for the veterans of any branch, uh, whether they're, they're uh, active, active uh, military or retired military, uh, to support their families. It's basically a resource facility for the veterans to be able to use to congregate at and to, to move out from when they need to, like I say, transportation base those types of things. The council really envisions it, envisions it as a, a low impact community type facility right next to a park that would have no greater impact in, in a community than a park might uh, and probably less so because it wouldn't be the noise. Right, and then this was not designated to one branch of the military or anything else, was no, it? No, they were very clear that the council wanted it available to any, for any branch of the military uh, to be able to utilize or their, you know, again, support for their families, active or retired military uh, of any branch. Right. Any branch, and, and I also heard that any from any area of the county. Oh, absolutely! It's not it's just for city here it's in these It's actually a, yeah. a good point if, if people from Ventura are going to Los Angeles and need to, to gather for for 
jointly going down to the VA facility, for example, or people coming from that area going up towards Ventura that want to carpool from Simi Valley have a place to meet and move forward. Just the parking lot alone will keep it from becoming a much you know larger facility of any style. We don't envision it growing at all. Right. Uh, it's really once then the council looks is looking at a, a low impact, low key facility to serve the needs of the veterans throughout Ventura County. Right, right. I think that was the big key is for all veterans all throughout the county. And Absolutely. it's located here, but it is not just a, lo a local community. Veterans. No, it's, it's not for just for Simi Valley at all. It's for veterans who have the need, and we've seen the need throughout Ventura County. There's the, you know, several groups in our community that work here and throughout the county for the troops, the military connection, others that I know your board has worked with quite a bit uh, that are serving veterans throughout this county that would be keyed into this and are already talking uh, with the nonprofit groups that are looking to, to try and, and provide those services out here as one more outreach facility for them. Right, and then you would allow the veterans to use this at an almost no cost situation. The, the key is to make it available at, at little or no cost uh, for the veterans groups to use and for the veterans to use. Great. That's Thanks great. so much. You see, by law, what has to happen is the governing, governing agency that owns the land has to provide it uh, first to first sale to uh, any of the other government agencies out there. So the uh, city of Simi Valley is certainly a first choice there. We appreciate your abiding by the law. <laughs> it certainly helps this community. We greatly appreciate your uh, your consideration of this, and uh, we know it's for mutual. It's for our mutual constituents, your constituents, our city council constituents, and countywide, all of your constituents. And so we appreciate your working with us to try and, and facilitate that uh, to make it happen. Our council is very anxious to see it work. And I think the uh, fire chief did all that legal side of going out to all the different community or government agencies that did it, and uh, and I guess. Through our, I won't say that. <laughs> All right, we got we got that done legally, and it's and it's worked out, and we don't have anybody else that's here doing correct. it. Correct, right? That's correct. The, the city, is my understanding, is the only government agency looking at it at this point in time. Right. Thank right. you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Chief Roper. Did you want to uh, comment at all on the transaction? I have a presentation. I'll just review exactly why we we're moving it and stuff under item 22. I can cover all of that. Okay. But as far as the transaction, the fire district uh, supports the action proposed to your board. Okay. Thank you. Supervisor, there goes. And I do have more speaker cards. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Our next speaker card is Marie Mason, followed by Holly Huff from the Santa Susana Knowles. Good evening, Ms. Mason. Hello, I'm Marie Mason. As you all know, I am the Vice President of the Susanna Hills Homeowners Association, but I am not here speaking for them since we had no knowledge of any of this. I read it in the newspaper this afternoon and then went to the website and then found out what it was. All our discussions about the fire station have been that the park district was interested in it. We've heard nothing about the city. I have no pros or cons against the veterans. My son-in-law is active duty Navy, so I obviously have an interest in veterans in the military. But that isn't the issue. The issue is our community is the most impacted. Maybe Simi can use it and the whole county can use it, but this is an impact on the Knowles. And I think we're a small community and I think the board is aware of the volatile nature in our community when we're not notified. Mm -hmm. I don't know the feelings of the people. I mean, we thought we had an agreement with your office, Supervisor Foy, that your office would notify us if something was going to be on the agenda just by a simple email to our president. So when I read this morning's paper, this afternoon, the paper that came this morning, um, called her and she said, I didn't get anything. So, I mean, I know it's our responsibility to go to the web, but we'd have to go to your web every week, and we'd have to go to the city's web every week. And it seems it's real easy to have one simple email say, this is important to us, and I don't know what the people in our community, they might think it's wonderful. I have no idea. I mean, we've gone from, we've heard all kinds of things that this is going to be, a daycare, uh, the Last thing we heard, maybe the sheriffs were going to have a substation there. So, I mean, our community asks every homeowner meeting, what's happening with the fire station? And all we can say is, we don't know because no one's ever told us. So I don't have an opinion for or against. I mean, great for the veterans. There's no parking there. I understand. I mean, we only knew what was happening when I talked to Councilwoman Williamson when we walked in the door. So I think when you're going to have an impact like this on the community, I think the community needs to know. Maybe they're going to be 100% behind it, 
But I don't know that because no one, I had no time to send out emails at 5 o'clock to say, so I'm just here representing myself to let you know that no one was, if the city's been talking about it, the city's talking about it. We don't really have interest in the city unless something's on the agenda in the city that pertains to us. And the city's pretty good about telling us. Okay. So be, you're, I know you're, you're going to the unincorporated area of yes. the city of Simi Valley. Yes. Yeah, so it, I mean, so we'd only there's they don't if they're going to step over the line into the Knowles, which is the unincorporated area. Usually somebody says, "Hey, this is going to be on the agenda because it's going to impact you guys." And so we've had nothing on this, and I just think you know this is a big decision. And I, if it's going to go to the city, it seems like it's kind of already a done deal, and I don't want to send a message that we're for or against it because I really don't know. I think our community should at least be offered the opportunity to say this is what's on the table because this has never been on the table to us. It's been a lot of other issues. but And you, you've mentioned that it might have gone to the park district. Well, right we now. were under the assumption that it was the park district. At one time, the fire department, we talked about maybe us buying it, mm -hmm. like, because it was for sale. So what are we going to do with it? So, I mean, there's been a lot of talk for a lot of years, because we knew the fire station was moving before supervised, before it was even on the board. It was back in Judy Michaels. Uh, I, I apologize it. that you weren't given notification of what the desired use of it is. And I'll just say that the vet Veterans are quieter than the kids. If they were well, I understand that, and I just think that <laughs> I know. I you, think in the neighborhood point is that, like the, you said, that you should have, to you would have liked table. to have had the input. Yes, so, and, and then I, we could have been you, here today saying, "Hey, we're thinking this is great. This is a go." Instead, I think we're here saying we're confused because we don't really know what our community thinks. And I think we're a small community, but a very active community. And I think we should at least have the right to have some input into. Uh, this is a big decision. These are a lot, this is a big impact. Even though some people might not think it is, I think it is. This is an impact to our community. We already have all the baseball and all that there. We live next to parks. We know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So I um, this is a big decision for your board to be making. And, and I think uh, I can correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. County Council, but I, my understanding is this is just a transfer of land. How they use it will be that will be coming forward from at, at a later time. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So. But once it's transferred to the city, it becomes the city's. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Once yes. it gets transferred, it once does, it's the it city's, is it's the city's, and they're pretty clear. They've had all their meetings. They've talked to all their people. It seems to me they're pretty clear what they want to do. So I don't think it's like we're all undecided. I think well, I, once I, it goes to the city, it's a decision that's kind of already been made. I, I appreciate your comments. I, I definitely, the board hears you that you would have liked to have been uh, notified in advance. Um, and um, I'll go ahead and Thank hear you. the next speaker, Ms. Ms. Huff. Hi, good evening, you Hi, guys. Evening. My name is Holly Huff, and um, I, Marie's kind of said it all, and obviously we have no issues with veterans but the issue was the notification that we didn't get any and um, we did get it in the past with previous supervisors that would tell us when something that was going to impact our community was going to be in Simi Valley for one thing we didn't even know so I personally have a little issue about that supervisor Foy um, other than that, no, we were pretty much thinking that it was going to the park district. They even talked about buying it. So obviously there's not going to be money exchanged because they'd have to have a lot of money to f bring it up to code and fix it. So this was just kind of a surprise this afternoon. So that's kind of, you know, obviously nobody knew. Everybody was busy. Nobody knew that, that you were having a town hall meeting for this end of the community here tonight because mm. you couldn't send us an email or something. And you know you've got our email, Supervisor Foy. You know you know Sandy. Could you please address the full board? I, I know, but I, I understand. Our, okay. So anyway, it's just a lack of communication and um, but we not the, knowing we the what's going on. We love on. the veterans. So but I mean, nobody's, <laughs> no, nobody's against veterans, right. for God's sake, right. you know. It's just the whole, the, the all of a the sudden, you know, we lost our fire department, and then we didn't know what was going on, and we weren't notified, and, and we did look up. That's why we're here tonight, because we did get on the website, which wasn't easy to figure out. So 
I'm sorry for not addressing all of you, but I just wanted Supervisor Foy to know to communicate with us. Okay, thank you. I think that is our last comment card on this item. And uh, at this point, we will uh, go back to our board. If you have any other questions of staff or would like to make any comments or a motion, um, this would be the time. Supervisor Zarek. Madam Chair, I just, um, you know, I, um, I know that the folks had uh, um, some concerns about notification, but um, I just want to share that I, I support the veterans. You know, my dad was Second World War veteran. I, I lost an uncle in the Korean War. I had a brother in Vietnam, in fact, two brothers in Vietnam, and, and a couple of nephews in Iraq, Marines, you know, that served the, uh, uh, served us all, you know, so. And also Steve Weber over in Oxnard, most of you guys know Steve Weber over the, we have our Veterans Memorial every, every year, and I, I just, I, I just support the veterans uh, 100 plus percent, you know, so. I'd like to make a motion that we approve this item. Second on this? I will second that. Okay. We have a motion and a second. And at this point, uh, could uh, all those in favor say aye? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? Not seeing any. That passes for zero and uh, comments noted. Next item on our agenda then is item number 22, and this is where we'll get the presentation about the, uh, from our uh, Chief Roper on the fire station number 43. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Powers, uh, Bob Roper, Fire Chief, Fire Protection District. Uh, what I want to do is just go over with you um, as a type of, give you a little bit of background about the fire station, why it was relocated and so forth, and to also invite everybody in the audience and your board for tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, we'll be having the de dedication of the new fire station. So. What this all began back in uh, 2003. We brought it to your board in July of 2003 with the request, the concept approval, and then your board approved the purchase of the property in September of 2003. So we looked at you know, the question of why did we end up doing move the fire station? Well, one, we had a fire station that was built in the 1950s, and that wasn't even the first fire station in the Knolls, the first fire station was run out of somebody's garage in 1945. But the station we're dealing with now is a 61-year-old fire station and something needed to be done with it. So what we did, we went to and created a gap analysis. And the gap analysis, what it does, it takes and looks at our service sector. What we try to do is serve everywhere within five minutes. But what it did is it pointed out that we had the area in the yellow in the center here is an area that was underserved, both the neighboring station here and here, as well as the current location that couldn't reach that area within the five minutes. In that area, the population is about 6,100 uh, people that we were feeling it was underserved. So we looked at that and we said, well, uh, what was wrong with the original location? Well, nothing. The original location was built in the Knolls, was the only population center at this end of Simi Valley back in 1950s. The center part of the city was more rural uh, ranch land and so forth. So the reason why the station was built there originally was, was on sound basis, but if we're going to invest the taxpayer dollars into a new facility at a cost of $3 million, could we relocate it and have it serve a larger core service area? So we also went and looked at our call loads. In this map, what it does is it shows call density. So the darker the color means the higher where the calls are happening. So you can see that this is the current location, and this is where we relocated the station, what we showed to the board in 2003 by lo moving it at no additional cost to staffing, only capital money to rebuild the new station. We can serve the area and at the same time, um, we can uh, serve a larger uh, portion of the people. As we move away, there's always the question about who loses and who wins. And in the area, we talked about the gap analysis of people that will see improved services and then we have to ask the question, well, if it moves one direction, who loses? And I won't say that anybody really loses, but in the more rural areas at the far end here, 
This is then outside of our standard five minute response time. But in today's world where we're using active vehicle locating services now is this data is all based off a of fixed lo location of where the fire station is. Now that we use a dynamic response system, a fire engine could be over in this area doing inspection, so this area won't be underserved, it would be greatly served. So it's all a matter of perspective there. So we looked at the, the issues the community raised, the board made the decision to support us in the relocation. The station is built now, it's on 1.78 acres, 8,500 square feet of uh, property. It has not only the fire station, but it has a, an ancillary training building that we're working out that the Red Cross can use, other community groups can use, and we will be able to do our training on site for the Simi Valley area. Other fire stations can do that. That way we don't have to send them back to Camarillo for some of the classroom training that we need to do. So it works out well. The station was built to uh, lead certification for a green certificate and we choose not to get the, the true certificate and we save the money that that would and we invested in the site but we have met all the energy provisions that we tried to do. The other core item for in Simi Valley is normally we have brush fires with east winds coming this direction and the one area that we don't have is a place to have our incident command post that has enough parking as we bring in all of our command staff. So we have a larger lot here and it has wire pre-wired from the telephone company so we can bring in remote vehicles and so forth and then we can use that as our command post. So it truly becomes a fully functioning station for us. I would like to thank the city staff who's worked well with us on the planning phase and the construction of it. I'd like to thank Put County Public Works who was our project manager as well as your board for support and then also the communities that we worked with as far as the input into the design and making us aware of what their concerns were as we are moving and it's our commitment to try to make sure that nobody loses any service in this transaction. For your board, um, the, I would have to say that you know this happened quick as far as the construction. The project came in on time, came in about a month and a half, almost two months ahead of schedule. And that, in a way, has caused us to jump through some hoops because we didn't want the old fire station to just be sitting there. So we've been hurried trying to get this transaction taken care of so it comes to your board here in Simi Valley so the city council could be here at the same time. And so um, we want to just make sure that your board's aware of that and then the city would follow up your action tonight with their council direction. So again, our dedication is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at the new location on LA and Yosemite and everybody in the community is invited. I'm available for any questions. Any questions, comments? Supervisor Foy? Oh, thank you. Um, this is, uh, as you do, you know, so the taxpayers are saying we're spending $3 million and what are we getting? We know we have a 60-year-old fire station, but the other issue is that big gap you have right there, you know, the 6,000 people that need to be covered. I think that's the key. I mean, I think the public says, I'll spend my money for public safety and this is what you're giving us is we need to be within these times and I think that's worked out very well and the location worked out very well on a, one of the major roads. It's easy to get in and out and I think it's worked and at the same time, it's still very, very close to the Knowles. So the Knowles still have all that, all that coverage, which I, it, it worked out well. But it's amazing just moving that. How far was it, like a mile or? Yeah, it's about a mile, mile and you pick up all those extra people from where it was. So, uh, yeah, it worked out very well, and I think it's a great, great use of taxpayer dollars here. Supervisor Zaragoza. Chief, you know, and I think uh, when I went over to Camarillo to see your, the computer center, if you were to have a fire truck or whatever right at, uh, at the green area where the 43 is now, that truck can go right to that any location within the green other than having to be dispatched from the uh, most populated areas, is that correct? Correct. So, so that, I mean, there's a benefit there if you're, if you have firefighters are, are in that area, they can uh, respond in less than, than the, that five minute time. Correct. So I think it's important for the, for the citizens to know that too. So, but uh, 
And with the new technology, it's not only the fire state, the fire engine that's assigned to that sector. If we had somebody else driving into the area, another fire uh, engine that was dropping off supplies or something, if they're closer, they'll get dispatched. The computer picks the that computer up. Computer center, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, no uh, further comments then. Uh, this is then a receive and file. Move to receive and file. Second. Got a motion and a second from Supervisor Foy. If we could, all those in favor say aye. 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 No opposition. We have officially received and filed the fire station number 43. Look forward report. to your uh, dedication to tomorrow night. And then uh, our next uh, item, we'll go to our 7.30 time certains, and this will be item 23 from our Human Services Agency. Welcome, Mr. Zimmerman. Good evening, Chair Parks, members of the board, Mr. Powers. Pleasure to be here to give a quick uh, kind of overview of what the Human Services Agency does and the services that we offer in Simi Valley. It's great to be out here with Simi Valley. They do uh, some tremendous work within their own community that really supports the needs of their, their members of the community that only aid and support us in our mission and our goal to serve those that uh, have needs and to serve the vulnerable population. Uh, I have a few slides just to give a quick uh, overview of what services we provide in the Human Services Agency. Our mission and goal is to serve those in uh, vulnerable populations, which are mainly elders, uh, those that are seniors and, and, and uh, do not have the appropriate support structures for protection issues or for basic needs, as well as children and, and meeting the needs of children that may be lacking in, in uh, in services, basic needs as in food, insurance for health care, as well as housing and protective issues. That, that's it in a broad sense what we do. These are specific programs I've listed on this slide here that uh, we offer. Our, our programs are countywide that, uh, that uh, we serve equally every community across the county in all the programs that uh, we have, and we're able to enhance that in, in, uh, with some of our partnerships and activities that we are pursuing with locations and staffing throughout the East County that we haven't had in, in the past. Uh, if you notice the, the items, CalFresh, Medi-Cal, CalWorks are the primary aid programs that we deal with. Just to point out that CalFresh is, was formerly known as food stamps as we, we brand that in a new way uh, there. Let me just show you, this is a map of our locations across the entire county, focusing on the east. And we, we segregated geographically in the east being Camarillo, Moore Park, Simi Valley, and Thousand Oaks. And uh, we recently were able to expand and open a, a true office in Thousand Oaks, which offers uh, the full array of services at greater capacity to the community there and partner with many of uh, nonprofit organizations. And we've been in conversation in the same model with other communities such as Simi Valley and Moore Park to duplicate that same model. We will be, as you know, opening up a service center in Moore Park with the Ruben Castro Human Services Center there sometime next year that will offer a full array of services where people can come in contact one-on-one -on -one with staff members to receive the services that they need or referrals to um, other programs that we have partnerships for. This here, let me get into some of the demographics and the magnitude of services that we provide across the county. This is a, a map showing services collectively for each of the, the cities throughout the, the, the county. The, the four cities that represent the uh, east represent about 21% of the total services or cases that we interact with at this point in time, or one quarter. So the blue and, and, and the quarter there. That is about from a comparative point, we use a benchmark of December 2007 as kind of a benchmark on trending of all our activities in the recent years because in 2008 was really the start or downturn of the economy, which which most of our programs, in particular in the needs-based areas, are sensitive to the, the economic conditions in the community, in particular with employment. So we have seen a greater demand grow 
in in those areas. In in 2007, the east represented about 19 percent of our caseload, and they're about 21 percent now. So so a little bit increase in in the total uh, services um, uh, within uh, the east county, and some of that is explained here. If we look at our unemployment, as was mentioned. Earlier, we have some very high unemployment areas through the Heritage Valley, through Santa Paula, Fillmore, and that region there. But the, the red numbers there are in the East County what the unemployment numbers are. Now, we may say that they're relatively low comparative to some other areas, but in magnitude, that, that is basically from 2007 doubling the unemployment rate in those respective geographical areas. And a double value, no, no matter which way you slice it, is a significant increase. And, and so there is impact and need associated with the community just as well as those other high areas that we also focus in on there. As represented in this slide here, as far as the need of our primary needs-based programs, we, we show an interesting phenomena that, uh, that that doubling effect associated with the impact on the community is that the rate of growth or the rate of need is greater in, in the East County at this particular point in time relative to the, the balance of the, the county. And, and that, that is consistent with, with everything that we measure and participate in, in basic needs of individuals that are most sensitive to the economic conditions. That, that as they fluctuate, that, that we see the, the fluctuation in need within families and structures within families to support the, the, the vital uh, resources in order to meet basic needs of health and welfare. Could I ask a question? There, yes. It is interesting to see that the East County increased significantly more than the West County, even though they're more affluent. But is it, is it because there's some kind of tipping point where, you know, like you were saying with unemployment, that it ends up seeing a greater increase out here? Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, the, the, the impact due to unemployment on that segment of the population uh, has experienced a greater need than they have in the past. So, so, and that's just the characteristic that, that we're seeing. I, I don't know how to explain it other than prior, generally what we've been seeing is individuals that have not needed resources for, for assistance. We're, we're seeing that population coming in and I think the impact is greater in the east, meaning that they, they were more on the edge, if you will, associated with uh, basic needs. Is this also more in the last 2010-11 versus 8-9, 9 10 recession and it, some people call it depression with some of those unemployment numbers yeah. continues. People just, at some point, you can't hang on any longer kind of thing. is Right. It, 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 I, th I don't know the rate of growth over those three years. I only know the comparative from the, the start of what we call the, the recession right. to, to date. So it would be interesting to see that, that curve, if the curve is flattening out or the curve is still climbing upward at this right. point. We do know we do know that there's significant increase in particular with food stamps or a supplemental program associated with food is highly sensitive to the unemployment rate. And 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 eligibility associated with that program is really based on the duration and time of unemployment benefits. And so so as as they start to wane or not eligible because they were not able to reemploy during a time period, the loss of those benefits would then make them eligible. And we've seen that more in in uh, in some communities uh, than other communities that that the, the exhaustion of the, of the unemployment benefits takes a longer period of time, but by the time they get to that exhausting, they're, they're in desperate need of, of services, and that, that could be a manifestation here as well. So, I do, thank you, Chair Parks. Just real quick, yes. uh, Mr. Zimmerman, uh, in terms of uh, job growth and incentives and so forth, you were telling me the other day about a CalWORKs program that incentivizes employers to hire people on CalWORKs? That, that, that's correct. We, we have a new program that we were able to get the, the program changed in this last budget cycle at the state legislature to do what, what is known a subsidized wage program for CalWORKs individuals. So those who are on welfare to work receiving uh, cash assistance 
can can work with an employer and and for the portion of their grant that they receive or the cash aid that they receive, we can use that to benefit an employer to hire them. And, and so the employer would be then then be able to receive a benefit as we aid an individual. And, and the benefit to that is that to what we're looking for, and we, we have many partnerships, is to, to allow our CalWORKs participants to connect with an employer and, and have an employer work with them to train them into the job so they can be stable there on out. And I think this will be a great stabilization for the employment community to connect with resources that, to, that they need to, to find em employers, you know, employees. Isn't it as much as uh, half their compensation? Yeah. It, right now the, the, the program will be set that uh, the, the reimbursement rate will be roughly 50% of the wage depending on the range. And the range usually typically we, we're talking entry level employees from eight fifty to twelve dollars an hour is is what it would be. And so that that will be a kicked off here in the in the next couple of months, the development of that program, which which will be a great benefit to um to the employers. Now we did a similar program like that with the stimulus money that came in where we we were able to uh, place individuals on the upwards of about just under 400 individuals with employers and, and, and able to subsidize it. And, and in some respects, the subsidy is to allow the employer to the time and expense that it takes to train an employee into the job. And so it's not just free. There, there's some effort that has to go into that, but it, it's turned out to be long-term success for the employment. So community. you have seen those people stay at those jobs? There's yes. Been some great, that's We've wonderful. seen in those jobs, uh, some of them were – uh, employment experience type jobs that that would give them the experience and then they'll transition to others about 50 percent then did stay or retain with the employment uh, we still have a little bit of an issue not an issue but it's an economic condition in the employment community in, in, entry-level jobs still uh, wane in hours meaning that they're they're still short a full-time job but uh, but uh, 20 hours is our start and we're, we'll move up from there so very, very positive coming in, in that respect. Thank Supervisor you. Supervisor Zaragoza. Very, yes. Do all employers uh, qualify for this? What? Yes, every, every employer qualifies for it. Regardless of size of uh, business. Yeah, that, that is correct. They just apply with, uh, with CalWORKs? Yeah, they'll, they'll apply through CalWORKs. More than likely what we're going to do is, is run it through a corporation that will actually employ the individuals and place them into companies at, at some kind of arrangement for, for the company. That's, That's wonderful. So, it mm -hmm. helps create jobs, and employers can get employees for almost half off, you know, the cost yeah. of, of hiring them. Absolutely, and, and hopefully so. it will generate some opportunity where an employer can As pick up the greater work and so to forth. providing some permanence to in, in the job. A absolutely. So that's, I, I just bring that up as, as a, a positive. We kind of identify the needs, and, and that's what I've, I've shown here. The, the needs that, that we, we see in the community, we try to meet those needs, and, and I, I, we don't do it alone. Those are our information numbers for those to contact and find out where they can get help. But very much communities do a lot of effort in, in supporting our programs through, through their missions, in particular many faith-based organizations who are sustaining and supporting families and, and, and reaching out to meet the basic needs uh, for the vitality of those families goes very much as a benefit to us. And, and we try to supplement, support them, and to meet them. Our, our, our primary mission is to, to allow people to have access as free as possible to, to meet those needs, and more importantly, that we serve the vulnerable population, and that's been our, our main thrust as far as protection of adults and children. So that's kind of a really quick overview and, and uh, thank you for your, your time and attention so we can communicate that tonight. We do really appreciate the new model that you're putting forward, the integrating with the other service providers and the nonprofits in the county. We've got the one over and under one roof in, in Thousand Oaks with the idea that you do have the faith-based organizations and other nonprofits all working to help the, the individuals who need it the most. And government can't do it on its own. The private sector can't. The nonprofits can't. So it's really great that we can work together. So. Absolutely. Thank you for thank your you. good work. All right. Thank you. And uh, at this point, then, we will need a motion to receive and file this report also. Motion. Second.
Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. No opposition. That motion passes. And we'll go on to our next item, which is item 24 with our health care agency, uh, talking about some of the health care services provided in the Simi Valley area. And Mr. Lorenz will be presenting that for us. Good evening, Chair Parks, members of the board, uh, Mr. Powers. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, on behalf of Dr. Gonzalez and the rest of the health care agency team, it's, it's uh, wonderful to be here to speak of the services that we provide to the residents of Simi Valley. Uh, first of all, uh, let me, this gentleman standing next to me is Dr. Stan Patterson, who will be joining me in this presentation shortly. But first I want to say to your board that uh, the health care agency, as you know, is a comprehensive integrated health care system serving diverse communities throughout Ventura County. Uh, and, of course, we'll talk about what we're doing here in Simi Valley. Uh, a lot of what we focus on as a health care agency is accessibility of our services, uh, the quality of our services, because, of course, the effort to provide access is coupled with the ability for us to provide quality health care service to our communities. And then, of course, uh, our ability to be uh, very focused in terms of our fiscal accountability and cost effectiveness is really what allows us to, to grow and develop our system and further meet the needs of our community, communities. Uh, then I, I have to also mention that our ability to carry out access and quality and being fiscally accountable is really attributed to our diverse and very talented workforce of the healthcare agency. Um, I do want to point out that we do have some leaders of the health care agency here tonight. Um, of course, Dr. Stan Patterson, but also Joan Araujo, who is our deputy director of our outpatient system. Uh, Narcy Egan, who is our chief financial officer. Uh, of course, we also have representatives from uh, Public Health, uh, Rigo Vargas and Steve Carroll. And then from Behavioral Health, we have uh, Pete Pringle. Dr. Gertsen and Anna Flores. So I, I really appreciate the time that they've spent to come out here and join us here in Simi Valley. One of the things that I spoke of, of course, is accessibility. And several years ago, in fact, uh, Mike Powers was then the health care agency director, we really looked at how we were providing services in the East County and looked at ways that we can enhance and improve accessibility to uh, health care services. And, and from uh, Mr. Zimmerman's presentation, I think we can all appreciate that throughout the county there is a growing need that we provide um, a safety net of health care services to our populations. Uh, what came about in terms of that effort was the, uh, the Mountain Gate Plaza Health Care Center here in Simi Valley, over close to 35, 40,000 square feet of services that uh, not only where we provide primary care, but we provide behavioral health and public health services. So truly, we have a one-stop location here for the residents of Simi Valley for health care services. Um, although the presentation does speak to the Simi Valley, I, I do want to mention that other areas of the East County include Moore Park, where we'll be working with others in terms of the Ruben Castro Center, um, as well as in South and Oaks, uh, where we will be opening close to 30,000 square foot facility that would also combine many of our health care services there in one location. Uh, so bringing comprehensive health care services to Simi Valley, uh, and as I've mentioned, we do provide for a number of services in terms of outpatient health care services, behavioral health and public health in one location. I'm going to have Dr. Patterson speak about the Sierra Vista Family Medical Clinic in Mountain Gate Plaza in terms of what he has accomplished as, uh, in support of the health care agency. Dr. Patterson has been with the health care agency for 10 years. He graduated from our family medicine residency program in 2001, which is a nationally recognized program, I must add, at VCMC. And he served as our director of our Magnolia Clinic in Oxnard, which is our second largest clinic in the county. And now he has chosen to help us out in taking over the, uh, uh, the responsibility for a Siri Vista clinic. So, Dr. Patterson. Thank you, uh, Chairman Parks, uh, <clears throat> members of the board, Mike Powers. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the Sierra Vista Family Medical Clinic. Uh, on January 17, 1994, uh, Simi Valley welcomed the opening of the Sierra Vista Clinic 
the clinic has steadily grown uh, in size and number of citizens served, uh, necessitating an expansion approximately two years ago this month. Um, and we're very happy there. Uh, we are now located in a beautiful facility in the Mountain Gate Plaza uh, off First Street and Los Angeles Avenue. You can see the increase in volume over the past several years leading to this year's fiscal pro projection uh, for visit volume. However, we've recently added several new providers and I believe uh, our year-end volume will exceed projections. The Sierra Vista Family Medical Clinic consists of a multi-specialty group uh, which represents the building blocks for the formation of the patient-centered medical home. We currently have 10 primary care providers which include family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics. We also have specialty services for cardiology, endocrinology, gastroenterology, infectious disease, nephrology, neurology, and obstetrics and gynecology just recently started a week ago. Our clients enjoy access to full laboratory and limited radiology five days per week, along with mammography services and two-dimensional echocardiography, as well as prenatal support and education via our Baby Steps program. We conduct retinal scans on site for the screening and early detection of retinopathy of chronic disease such as diabetes. Access is important to us, and we have urgent care services available seven days per week. We anticipate further growth in our primary care and specialty care access uh, <clears throat> as the Sierra Vista, uh, Vista Clinic underwent a patient visit redesign in 2007 uh, to improve the patient experience in our facility, and we will continue to improve on this as we grow over time. Quality of care is very important to us, and we collect and analyze data for each of our diabetics so that we may design methods within our facility to provide world-class care uh, with quality outcomes and best practices. These same principles can be applied to hypertension, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, uh, which in addition to diabetes represent the most costliest chronic diseases in healthcare if not treated effectively. We want people to know that they will receive the best care when they walk through our doors. Our home is your home, and we strive to always be patient-centered. I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for believing in the mission of the healthcare agency and giving us the resources to deliver health care in the highest quality uh, to the residents of the County of Ventura. I especially want to thank Mike Powers for improving on the mission during his tenure uh, and positioning the healthcare agency for even greater success as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. We'll take it back to Mr. Lorenz. Mr. Powers, Just you want a quick to comment. comment. I mean, Dr. Patterson did such a great job managing the Magnolia Clinic that uh, we rewarded him by giving another clinic. But, <laughs> but we're very lucky that he's uh, agreed to come out here and he's already made a tremendous impact here in running the clinic. Just a quick question for Dr. Patterson in terms of having all the services under one roof from a clinician standpoint. What, what do you see the benefit of that for the patient? Oh, absolutely. With mental health and, uh, and you health. know when you look at uh, fragmented uh, systems, you know where you have a patient going from one location to another location to another location for primary care, specialty care, other services, uh, laboratory services, radiology, you know, it, it becomes a hindrance in terms of, uh, you know, creating barriers. It, it creates barriers for, for what we're trying to accomplish. And we know that we can deliver uh, care uh, to the highest of quality, you know, when we put all of our services, as many as we can combine in one roof to create that patient-centered medical home. Mm -hmm. Especially when, you know, you're talking about ill people, <laughs> you right, know, right. and that they don't have to go from one building to another and drive far, and they can do it all in one. That's great. I can give you a perfect example. You know, we, uh, we have a number of children in the county of Ventura that suffer from horrific d diseases, um, and they have to be uh, cared for in tertiary care facilities like Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. And just by developing uh, a partnership with uh, that very large and very well-known um, program, uh, hospital, you know, we've been able to have their specialists come out to our facilities and provide world-class care to the citizens of Ventura County, you know, which is unmatched. It's, it's, it's unheard of. And, and those would be definite barriers as you look at, you know, the distance between downtown Los Angeles and downtown Ventura. Supervisor Foy. I say, Dr. Peterson, I know that everybody, when I heard that, uh, well, I was told that you'd be taking over. I know these two over here, everybody was all excited about you taking this in, in this great new facility. 
Has uh, the community, are they aware of what you've got here now? And I mean, you've come into this now. Is everybody in the community aware that people understand what, what we've got in this facility? We're trying the best we can to make people aware. And, you know, we, we do little things uh, in terms of our flu clinics, uh, Tdap clinics for, for the children in, in terms of, you know, getting to school on time. Um, and, you know, just making our, our awareness, making ourselves uh, known, you know, in the community. Uh, we've got, you know, senior events, uh, you know, that we've been planning, all kinds of things. Well, good. I'm glad to, I mean, because a lot of people know that if they need to go to the facility for some reason, they come around the corner and they go in there and go, wow, this is a county facility? Yeah. This is unbelievable. And I'm sure you probably had people say those kind of things. And it, it's great that we can, the people who need it, don't have to suffer under any substandard. Like you said, the care has always been great. The facility now is top notch. Everything is working well for all these people. So that's, that's wonderful. And I appreciate all the hard work. I know how excited they were you taking this over. So <laughs> thank you. Yes, Supervisor here goes. Dr. Ahead. Patterson, we're going to miss you in Oxford, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually <laughs> still there. Not going any place, okay. <laughs> I'm actually still there. The other question I had of the uh, urgent care what are the hours for that? The urgent care is open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. That is fantastic because sometimes the uh, major hospitals, the ERs, are, are jam-packed so that urgent care really, really helps. Uh, I Absolutely. know the one over on the Gonzales is used quite a bit too. Uh, if St. John's is full, they can go right over to that urgent care center. We try to keep them from going to St. John's, but, you know, in terms <laughs> of, you know, out of out of the, the big hospitals and, and, sure. and treat what we can treat and, and keep people well. That's, keep, that's just keep them out of the hospital. Keep them out of the hospital. Keep them out of the hospital in general. And thank you for your excellent work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And also uh, a successful uh, uh, resident from our program. So that's really nice yeah. to see not too many areas, uh, counties have residency programs. And it, ours has been very successful and you're a shining example. So thank, thank you. you. And on for more, uh, Mr. Lorenz? Just a bit more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have to tell you that one of the things that uh, we as a health care agency also do, and it was brought up in some respect here, is that we do work with the local community providers, and we have a very good relationship with Simi Valley Hospital, and I'm sure that they're happy to see that we have an urgent care center to keep people in the right place in terms of receiving the right care at the right level. Uh, it's I, so expensive once you're in a hospital or you have to go to the emergency room. It's so expensive. So it's nice to be able to keep them healthy and go through the clinic system instead. That's, that's absolutely true. We do, of course, at this location have behavioral health services located there. And some of the services that we provide there, of course, are our DUI program, our alcohol and drug programs, adult mental health services, and use and family services uh, around mental health. The, this is just an overview of the DUI program, and of course, all of the programs in mental health are evidence-based programs uh, that focus on uh, outcomes. And we're very fortunate uh, that that we have a, a wonderful staff in delivering these services here in Simi Valley. Um, this program alone, in terms of service using units, is over 19,000 um, alcohol and drug programs. And, of course, uh, one of the tenets of health care is uh, to focus on prevention. And uh, the Behavioral Health Department and Alcohol and Drug Programs does a very good job in doing so. And, and a lot of it is about working with the community on a, in a collaborative manner. And this is one program, Highway 118 Safety Task Force, where we work with local law enforcement officials here in the city of Simi Valley to, to focus on an effort to prevent drinking under the influence. Wonderful program. Uh, adult mental health services, and they range uh, from medical management all the way through to case management and housing assistance. Of course, youth and family mental health services uh, focused at, on services ranging from depression to aggression and, and traumatic situations that may, they may encounter. Um, public health, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, they provide a variety of programs here in, in the East County and in, in Simi Valley. Um, we spoke a little about earlier in this board meeting about homeless services, and together between public health and our outpatient system, we do focus on providing access to the homeless population here in Ventura County and Simi Valley. Um, 
This is a, a program not people, many people hear about, but it is a very important, important program from a preventive health standpoint, and it is a supplemental nutrition program focused on pregnant women, children through age five, and, um, and infants, of course. And in Simi Valley, we serve a, probably about uh, 2,000 individuals through, the, through this program. And of course, uh, speaking of public health, and if you have not received your flu shot, uh, you are able to receive flu shots here in Simi Valley at the uh, Sierra Vista Family Medical Clinic. So we do encourage people to, to focus on uh, their health. It is the season, isn't it? It is the season. Let's get your flu shot. And Thank that you. is our presentation. If you have any questions. I know that uh, Dr. Gertson's here too, and uh, what a wonderful program that she's put together in helping to look at people that have co-occurring disorders of both mental illness and an addiction problem and have put together some very good pilot work that is being emulated elsewhere throughout the country and, and that it's a, such a success people don't want to leave the program, <laughs> what I had heard. So uh, it's, it's nice to see us being innovative and being successful in helping people. So Good work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, we have an uh, opportunity again to receive and file, and this is the health care agency report. Move to receive and file. Got a motion and a second from Supervisor Foy. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. <laughs> and uh, that motion passes 4-0. And now we can go to the regular agenda items that I thought I might get in before 7 a.m. <laughs> I'm at 7 p.m. It's not that bad. It could have been worse, right? <laughs> I think, so I think this he, is with a yes. Yeah, I think he sent home his uh, three free help it was there. It past huh? their bedtime. I don't so. blame him. Uh -huh. But I do appreciate uh, trying to squeeze it in before board comment. But uh, uh -huh. uh, good evening. Uh -huh. I, I'm really glad you're holding the meeting here in Simi. This is my home city. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up here in Simi Valley, and uh, Simi Valley used to have an airport uh, that I remember sort of lying under the approach back in the 70s as a little kid watching airplanes fly over. Uh, but it was closed, and I you think are the today is. head of the airport in yeah. the county. Here we go. Started sort of a residency program for <laughs> Valley and airports. Uh, so he's getting the presentation ready. So there's there's two items. The first is uh, a construction management services and also geotechnical services for our uh, new parallel taxiway project that we've just broke ground on. Uh, the contractor overall has already begun mobilization. And so this contract is to oversee uh, that the design that is put in place is actually being constructed. And uh, at $270,000, Mead and Hunt is the engineering firm that designed the parallel taxiway. But $270,000 is about 6% of the overall project, which is $4.3 million to build the parallel taxiway. Uh, normally, these types of contracts for the A&Es uh, range in the 10 to 12 percent range. So this is a, a very competitive contract that Mead and Hunt's put together for us. Could you um, uh, discuss the um, difference uh, in terms of this project with uh, resurfacing or just putting a slurry still? Because I know that was this part of the change. This is a brand new taxiway. You see the yellow line there. That is basically just dirt right now. And so we're building a full-length parallel taxiway at the airport. Right now we only have one taxiway. Uh, it's taxiway Foxtrot that goes along the length of the airport. And so you have conflict between airplanes trying to get from one airport at one end of the airport to the other. And also we have uh, some larger business jets based at Camarillo that they don't have the wingtip clearance. Uh, I mean, they can get by, but they are not meeting the technical standards that the FAA has in place passing these hangars along the way to get out to the approach into the runway. So this new taxiway will allow us to meet those wingtip clearance standards without having to relocate hangars in a place that we just don't have to put. So. And obviously doing a, a resurfacing, uh, being able to do that is much more long-term cost-effective than just putting a slurry still out. I, I yes, yeah. but, but again, this is a brand new taxiway. It's, there's nothing there today. It's and, and being constructed from the ground. And that's a safety issue too, you know, right? It is with a wingtip clearance it, issue and also conflict between aircraft. Exactly. I'd like to make a motion that we approve. There's some big <laughs> aircraft when you go buy a little aircraft and those big ones. <laughs> that's good to have some separation. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we do have a motion from Supervisor. Oh, well, we uh, there's that. It's okay. two items. This is just one slide for the first. So we, the first this okay. is Cambrian, then second it. All right, we do have a second. 
Awesome. Airport Authority heard it unanimously. So, <laughs> okay. It's also uh, it's ninety five percent grant funded from the FAA and another two and a half percent match from the state. So we're spending two and a half cents on the dollar to get this project done. Excellent. Uh, we have a motion and a second. See no objections. The motion passes four zero. And now to the next item. Okay, this is a, a contract change order that is quite substantial. This uh, is probably the one with the resurfacing. This is. I'm sorry. That, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So uh, the, the overall project here uh, that your board has approved in the past is essentially relocating the landing threshold back 924 feet to the east. So we're gaining that additional length for landing. Uh, it's mostly a safety project providing more runway distance to planes to land and stop but it will create an opportunity for uh, aircraft that aren't using the airport now but fit within our approved air aircraft fleet mix uh, to use the airport. So it should create some opportunity to enhance the business there at the Oxnard Airport. So the original contract uh, with Nyan Nelson was for uh, about $960,000, which was about 11% below the engineer's estimate. And so we're asking for your board to approve uh, a contract change order in the amount of $314,000. It's about a 34% increase. The reason we're doing this is because we've, we've essentially found some more grant money. And so rather than give it back because we can't spend it, we found some additional things that we can do uh, to benefit the airport and take advantage of that 95% funding from the FAA to spend some more grant money. And so uh, the first is uh, next year we have uh, a lighting upgrade project for the runway, and so we want to accomplish a portion of that now uh, while we're working in this area anyways, moving the displaced threshold. And so that amounts to about $90,000. And then the other, uh, everything you see in red, uh, were originally contracted uh, replacement of asphalt. Uh, these areas were just uh, in really rough shape, and then these pieces down here are actually where we removed an in-pavement lighting system, an approach lighting system. And then we're adding uh, these areas in yellow. Uh, the contractor has already done those, actually, knowing that he was doing those at risk because we didn't have your board's approval in ahead of time. And so that was another $46,000. But the big ticket item is additional slurry where it's, as you mentioned, it's uh, preventative maintenance uh, to help maintain the asphalt that we have in place already. But originally contracted in red were the exit taxiways and a portion of the ramp, and we're able to, uh, to add in, it's about 50,000 square yards of slurry in these other two areas. Uh, and it, that is the bulk of the change order, is almost $180,000. Uh, but again, it's all, it's 95% federal grant money that we're trying to take advantage of and not have to return at the end of the project. So, and I guess the other line there is because of the extent uh, and the fact that this is a short-term project, we're looking to be done with all of this work the end of next week and reopen that runway with the new threshold, uh, that it's not in the county's best interest to take this out to competitive bid. And so that's part of your recommendations tonight as well. Madam Chair. Yes. The other thing, too, because you talked about safety, and safety, you might want to share to or remind us that, all, all of us, that we bought those, that acreage just east of, uh, of Ventura Road, you know, for, for the landing. Yeah, we did in the runway protection zone. We bought the, uh, where the, there's a flower grower there now that Excellent. farms that. In fact, he's going to stay, so it's generating some additional revenue for the airport. Uh, but that was 11 acres that we purchased earlier this year. Acres and the, the easement over towards uh, Till Club Road, too. That's next year's project is some property <clears throat> and some easements on the north side of the airport. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Long, you have a move the recommended action. A motion second. and a second. Uh, see no objection. That motion passes on a 5 0. Welcome right. back, Supervisor Bennett. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. My apologies for stepping out. I may have to step out again in a few minutes. Okay. Our next item with, with our fire chief again, and this is regarding a, an agreement with the Department of Forestry. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Powers, Bob Roper. The item before you is just the renewal of the contract between your board and the state of California to protect the 300 some odd thousand acres of state responsibility areas here in the county. Your board has an agreement with the fire district that goes on and on that we act as your agents to carry out this contract. This contract yields the fire district about $9.9 .9 million currently every year. 
This is a three-year contract, and so it's kind of a standard thing for us. The one thing I would like to point out to your board is that anything that happens to the CAL FIRE total budget within the state, we also share in the good if it's increased, which doesn't happen very often, but also uh, for any uh, reductions in the state's budget. And currently we're working with CAL FIRE because they're opposed to have a 16% budget reduction. How much of that affects this contract is still up in the air. I'm available if you have any questions. If I can ask. So if it re does reduce, we're still under contract to provide service without the funding, the 16% or some portion reduction, or we just wouldn't be providing some type of? Uh, what it looks like is their total 16% budget reduction for us uh, under the one scenario may yield us about a 2 or 3% total oh, okay. reduction under ours. Now. The question is, is do we still have to uh, I protect guess their lands? Yeah, we still protect them, even though we're not getting funded for it. Yeah, that, we, w we would still do that, but we would also change our performance measures on how we would do that. Oh, okay. All right. Hard times when the state wants to cut back on uh, the ability to fight fires. Yeah, the number one thing is public safety. That's right. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, good agreement here. So Move do we the recommended action. Second. Motion? From Supervisor Long, second from Supervisor Foy. If we could all please say aye. 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 <laughs> and that passes unanimously. Thank you, Chief. And uh, now we'll go to item 28, and this is with our health care agency and public health. And Mr. Carroll, good evening. Chair Parks, member <laughs> of the board. Uh, Mr. Powers, good evening. I'm Steve Carroll, uh, the Emergency Medical Services Administrator. Uh, before you tonight is a couple of uh, items uh, related to the Emergency Medical Services Agency. Uh, we're requesting a budget modification uh, to uh, address a few items uh, in our uh, agreements and our um, ambulance service agreement uh, that we did not do at the initial uh, uh, agreement in June. Uh, we're also asking for a um, budget modification for the fire district's share of the image trend contract uh, that was approved uh, that will allow us to uh, continue the necessary budget transactions and also some additional equipment and facility costs within the MS agency as a, as a uh, result of a consolidation of the emergency preparedness office into the MS agency. Uh, recommendation number two involves a request for two additional positions in the MS agency uh, directly related to that consolidation and the additional responsibilities and a proposed reorganization of our agency to better uh, coordinate and uh, manage our responsibilities. And then lastly, recommendation number three is a request to uh, delete a vacant uh, office assistant three position that's no longer needed. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Move the recommended action. We have a motion of Supervisor Bennett and second from Supervisor Zaragoza. Uh, can we all please say aye? Aye. aye. <laughs> and that passes unanimously. Thank you. And I, yeah, I have a, a comment not specific to your department, but in this particular instance, we have the federal or state funding for programs that while we already have pretty large descriptions on our agenda of what the uh, is coming before us, it would be nice to actually put in there federal funds or state funds so people realize this where the funds are coming from. I think that would be educational and helpful. We'll do that. Thank you. Where you can. Good evening. You're back. Good evening. I'm back. We're on item 29. <laughs> Perfect. And this is with our county executive office and the cooperative agreement. For payment in lieu of taxes, uh, agreement modification. Uh, for the record, my name is Christy Madden with the county executive office. Give, good evening. Uh, the item before you this evening is a request that your board authorize the chair to sign an amended cooperation agreement with the area housing authority and to authorize the CEO or his designee to sign an MOU related to those pilot payments. Um, payment in lieu of taxes are paid by, uh, by the Area Housing Authority on the public housing properties that they manage within their jurisdiction. Um, the cooperating agreements um, were developed in the early 80s and essentially what they do is the Area Housing Authority 
passes to the county for distribution as regular property tax, an amount equal to 10% of the rent that is collected on public housing uh, properties within their jurisdiction. The county entered into our agreement with the Area Housing Authority in August of 1982. Um, as revenues were declining across um, all housing authority operations, the area housing authority notified the county of Ventura and the other jurisdictions where they have pilot agreements that they would not be making their pilot payments, they would be retaining them to provide um, operating reserves in the event um, that they didn't have sufficient revenues to operate their programs at their public housing projects. Uh, that went on for several years. The county had requested that they go ahead and make their pilot payments and their, they did not make those payments. They were not forthcoming. Um, they consulted with several of the cities that they had uh, pilot agreements with and those cities had acknowledged that the Area Housing Authority could retain those funds and they were using the funds to, put, to support programs at each of their public housing projects. Depending upon the types of projects, it would be brown bag programs, senior programs, education, homework assistance, those types of things. The Housing Authority also has an agreement with the federal government that um, allows them to get funding for operations at their facilities. And when HUD came in and did a review of the Housing Authority's operations some years ago, they uh, told the Housing Authority that they need to make good on their pilot payments because they had a contract with the federal government and the federal government contract referred to these cooperation agreements with the cities. So what the Housing Authority did is they made good on their back uh, property tax PILT payments and are now going to all of the jurisdictions where they have public housing projects and requesting that we modify that agreement to allow the Housing Authority to retain the funds for the purposes that they have been using the funding for. The PILT agreements, um, the funding comes to the county for distribution of the tax. The amount of funding generated by the one project in the unincorporated area generates about just a little bit less than $9,000 a year. About a third of that, as you know, from property tax distribution would be coming back to the county and county agencies. So the impact of today's item results in about a $3,000 a year loss of uh, revenue that would be coming to county agencies. As I indicated, by supporting this program, it allows the Housing Authority to to implement some very important programs and activities at all of their public housing projects that would ultimately reduce impacts on county operations and um, other county services. I do have representatives from the Area Housing Authority in the audience if you have any technical questions that I can't respond to. Thank you, and I know their executive director, uh, Doug Ta Douglas Tap King, was here earlier too. He was, so. and he left. Have we any questions? I want to get into some real good detail on this. No, okay. <laughs> I think people are tired. I'm just waking up. Here. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, can we all um, vote by saying aye? Aye. aye. <laughs> all right. And that motion passes unanimously. And that uh, gets us over to item 30. And this is a recommendation by Supervisor Zaragoza. Move approval. I move approval and a second to uh, uh, pre reappoint Carmen, Carmen Hurd to the Commission on Women. All in favor say aye. Aye. And no objections. That passes unanimously. Next item is item 31. This is my recommendation to reappoint Megan Sandoval and Janelle Smith, two wonderful members of our Casa Caneo MAC, to be reappointed because their term's up. And then also um, a, a fine gentleman who's a, a, a public school teacher out there at Weathersfield, David Ayers, has agreed to be on the Municipal Advisory Council. And uh, just a, a wonderful guy decided that he wanted to volunteer to do graffiti cleanup in that area. And uh, we lassoed him in, and um, he filled out an application. So we have him to add to our council. So with that, I move the, uh, that appointment, second. the motion, and a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you. And then finally, we have item 32. I believe this is our last item. I bet you're happy. But I think we should wait. A, we should probably wait a little while before we get. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> after yeah, nine at yeah. night, and we'll go to uh, Chris Stevens with our resource management agency regarding some upgrades in our system. Good evening, Senate. Chair Parks, uh, members of the board, Mr. Powers. Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Stevens from the RMA, and uh, are you ready for the big finish? Um, <laughs> Uh, the the uh, the item tonight is, before you is an amendment to our contract with uh, our vendor for our land records management system, Acela. And as you recall, you um, uh, approved the project uh, in June of 2010. It's about a 4.3 million dollar project, and uh, a portion of that, about uh, 1.8 million of that, was for a contract to the Acela. Corporation for the uh, development and implementation of the upgrade to the system. Uh, over the course of our work, we've identified uh, a couple of items that are going to require some additional uh, costs to us. Uh, they are described in the board letter. They are some uh, a few additional databases that we would want to convert into the new system. Uh, that we identified, and then secondly, were some uh, additional travel costs. Uh, the uh, initial estimate in the contract um, has proven to be inadequate. We've been requiring uh, the consultants to be down here to meet with our staff a number of times, and that really helps us ensure that we're getting good communication between what our needs are and when they go back to work on that software. Uh, we think it's real important to, to have done that and to continue that as we move into the testing phase. And so we are recommending uh, that we increase that travel budget. Um, the good news is uh, we have had savings in other line items, and this is a net uh, no increase to the project amount. Move so the recommended item. Second. Uh, that you like a, that last part? That was a good ending. <laughs> We're waiting the fastest, to hear that. fastest a seller item we've ever had. <laughs> So we have a motion and a Just second. Have you heard that um, last part. All yeah. in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Chris. All Thank right. you very much. Thank you. And uh, uh, this has been a special meeting. A uh, special meeting that uh, says it on the agenda because we're here in the city of Simi Valley. And just genuine thanks to the community for coming out. And everybody, I thanks, thanks for uh, doing this. I know it's late, for but bringing us. thank it you was for a, coming, a, everybody. It was a pleasure Actually, to be here and, and hear from your community. And with that, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Only a half hour off, Roberta. <laughs> <laughs>